Chapter 11 The Lieutenant I was walking with a guard, behind and a little to the right of her, so my feet would not touch the sacrosanct mat, down a corridor I had not seen before. A turn to the right, a few steps down, right again. What an endless labyrinth that this prison was. At last, we stepped out into a small interior courtyard. A drizzle of rain was falling. It was a chill, raw morning in late May. After three months in prison, I had been called for my first hearing. Barred windows stared from tall buildings on three sides of the courtyard. Along the fourth was a high wall, and against this stood a row of small huts. So these were where the infamous interrogations took place. My breath came short and hard as I thought back to the reports I had passed on the night of Hitler's birthday. Lord Jesus, you were called to your hearing too. Show me what to do. And then I saw something. Whoever used the fourth of the huts had planted a row of tulips along the side. They were wilted now, only tall stems and yellowing leaves, but, dear Lord, let me go to hut number four. The guard had paused to unstrap a long military cape fastened to the shoulder of her uniform. Protected from the rain, she crunched up the gravel path, past the first hut, the second, the third. She halted in front of the hut with the flower bed and rapped on the door. Ya, yeah, Karin, called a man's voice. The guard pushed open the door gave a straight arm salute and marched smartly off. The man wore a gun and a leather holster and a bare-boned uniform. He removed his hat and I was staring into the face of a gentle-mannered man who had visited me, visited me in my cell. I am Lieutenant Roms, he said, stepping to the door to close it behind me. You're shivering. Here, let me get a fire going. He filled a pot a pot-bellied stove from a small coal scuttle for all the world, a kindly German householder entertaining a guest. What if this were all a subtle trap? This kind human manner, perhaps he had simply found it more effective than brutality and tricking the truth from affection-starved people. Oh, Lord, let no weak gullibility on my part endanger another's life. I hope, the officer was saying, we don't have many more days this spring as cold as this one. He drew out a chair for me to sit on. Wearily, I accepted it. How strange, after three months, to feel a chair back behind me. Chair arms for my hands. The heat from the stove was quickly warming the little room. In spite of myself, I began to relax. I ventured a timid comment about the tulips. So tall. They must have been beautiful. Oh, they were. He seemed ridiculously pleased. The best I've ever grown. At home, we always have Dutch bulbs. We talked about flowers for a while, and then he said, I would like to help you, Miss Timboom, but you must tell me everything. I may be able to do something, but only if you do not hide anything from me. So there it was already. All the friendliness, the kind of concern that I have half believed in. All a device to elicit information. Well, why not? This man was a professional with a job to do. But I, too, in a small way, was a professional. For an hour he questioned me using every f philosophical trick that the young men of our group had drilled me in. In fact, I felt like a student who was crammed for a difficult exam and then is tested on only the most elementary material. It soon became clear that they believed the Beji had been headquarters for raids on food ration offices around the country. All of the illegal activities I had on my conscience, this was probably the one I knew least about. Other than receiving the stolen cards each month and, and passing them on, I knew no details of the operation. Apparently, my real ignorance began to show. After a while, Lieutenant Roms stopped making notes of my hopelessly stupid answers. Your other activities, Miss Timboom? What would you like to tell me about them? Other activities? 
Oh, you mean you want to know about my church for mentally retarded people? And I plunged into an eager account of my efforts at preaching to the feeble-minded. The lieutenant's eyebrows rose higher and higher. What a waste of time and energy, he exploded at last. If you want converts, surely one normal person is worth all the half-wits in this world. I stared into the man's intelligent blue-gray eyes. True national socialist philosophy, I thought. Tulip bed or no. And then to my astonishment, I heard my own voice saying boldly, May I tell you the truth, Lieutenant Roms? This hearing, Miss Timboom, is predicated on the assumption that you will do me that honor. The truth, sir, I said, swallowing, is that God's viewpoint is sometimes different from ours, so different that we could not even guess at it unless he had given us a book which tells us of such things. I knew it was madness to talk this way to a Nazi officer, but he said nothing, so I plunged ahead. In the Bible, I learned that God values us not for our strength or our brains, but simply because he has made us. He knows. In his eyes, a half-wit may be worth more than a watchmaker or a lieutenant. Lieutenant Rom stood up abruptly. That will be all for today. He walked swiftly to the door. Guard! I heard footsteps on the gravel path. The prisoner will return to her cell. Following the guard through the long, cold corridors, I knew I had made a mistake. I had said too much. I had ruined whatever chance I had that this man might take an interest in my case. And yet the following morning, it was Lieutenant Roms himself who unlocked my cell door and escorted me to the hearing. Apparently, he did not know of the regulation that for forbade prisoners to step on the mat, for he indicated that I was to walk ahead of him down the center of the hall. I avoided the eyes of the guards along the route. Guilty, as well-trained dog discovered on the living room sofa. In the courtyard this time, a bright sun was shining. Today, he said, we will stay outside. You are pale. You are not getting enough sun. Gratefully, I followed him to the farthest corner of the little yard where the air was still and warm. We settled our backs against the wall. I could not sleep last night, the lieutenant said, thinking about what that book where you have read such different ideas. What else does it say in there? On my closed eyelids, the sun glimmered and blazed. It says, I begin slowly, that a light has come into this world so that we need no longer walk in the dark. Is there darkness in your life, Lieutenant? There was a very long silence. There is great darkness, he said at last. I cannot bear the work I do here. Then all at once he was telling me about his wife and children in Bremen, about their garden, their dogs, their summer hiking vacations. Bremen was bombed again last week. Each morning I asked myself, are they still alive? There was one who has them always in his sight, Lieutenant Roms. Jesus is the light the Bible shows to me. The light that can shine even in such darkness as yours. The man pulled the visor of his hat lower over his eyes. The skull and crossbones glinted in the sunlight. When he spoke, it was so low I could hardly hear. What can you know of darkness like mine? Two mornings, the hearings continued. He dropped all pretense of questioning me on my underground activities and seemed especially to enjoy hearing about my childhood. Mama, father, the aunts. He wanted to hear stories about them again and again. He was incensed to learn that father had died right here in Shriven Nijin. The documents on my case made no mention of it. These documents did answer one question, the reason for solitary confinement. Prisoner's condition contagious to others in the cell. I stared at the brief tight words where Lieutenant Rom's finger rested. 
I thought of the long wind haunted nights, the scowling guards, the rule of silence. But if it wasn't punishment, why were they so angry with me? Why couldn't I talk? The lieutenant squared the edges of the papers in front of him. A prison is like an institution. An institution, Miss Timboom. Certain rules. Certain ways of doing things. But I'm not contagious now. I've been better for weeks and weeks, and my own sister is so close. Lieutenant Roms, if I could only see Betsy. If I could just talk with her a few minutes. He lifted his eyes from the desk, and I saw anguish in them. Miss Timboom, it is possible that I appear to you a powerful person. I wear a uniform. I have certain authority over those under me, but I am in prison. Dear lady from Harlem, a prison stronger than this one. It was the fourth and final hearing, and we had come back into the small hut for the signing of the per se verbal. He gathered up the completed transcript and went out with it, leaving me alone. I was sorry to say goodbye to this man who was struggling so earnestly for truth. The hardest thing for him seemed to be that Christians should suffer. How can you believe in God now? he asked. What kind of a god would let that old man die here in Srivenigan? I got up from the chair and held my hands out to the squat little stove. I did not understand either why father had died in such a place. I did not understand a great deal. And suddenly I was thinking of father's own answer to a hard question. Some knowledge is too heavy. You cannot bear it. Your father will carry it until you are able. Yes, I would tell Lieutenant Roms about the train case. He always liked stories about father. But when the lieutenant returned to the room, a guard from the woman's wing was with him. Prisoner Tin Boom has completed her hearings, he said. He will re she will return to her cell. The young woman snapped to attention. As I stepped through the door, Lieutenant Roms leaned forward. Walk slowly, he said. In corridor F. Walk slowly. What did he mean? The guard strode down the long door-lined wall so swiftly I had to trot to keep up with her. Ahead of us, a prison trustee was unlocking the door to a cell. I trailed behind the guard as much as I dared, my heart thumping wildly. It would be Betsy's cell. I knew it. Then I was abreast of the door. Betsy's back was to the corridor. I could see only the graceful, unswept bun of her chestnut hair. The other woman in the cell stared curiously into the corridor. Her head remained bent over something in her lap, but I had seen the home Betsy had made in Shrivenigan. For unbelievably, against all logic, the cell was charming. My eyes seized only a few details as I inched reluctantly past. The straw pallets were rolled instead of piled in a heap, standing like little pillars along the walls, each with a lady's hat atop it. A headscarf had somehow been hung along the wall. The contents of several food packages were arranged on a small shelf. I could just hear Betsy saying, The red biscuit tin here in the center. Even the coats hanging on the books on their hooks were part of the welcome of that room. Each sleeve draped over the shoulder of the coat next to it like a row of dancing children. Schneller! I'll be Schneller! I jumped up and hurried after my escort. It had been a glimpse, only two seconds at the most, but I walked through the corridors of Sh Shrevenigen with Betsy's singing spirit at my side. All morning I heard doors opening and closing. Now keys rattled outside my own. A very young guard in a very new uniform bounded in. Prisoner stand at attention, she squeaked. I stared at her wide, blinking eyes. The girl was in formal, mortal fear of something or someone. Then a shadow filled the doorway, and the tallest woman I have ever seen stepped into the cell. Her features were classically handsome, the face and height of a goddess, but one carved in marble, not a flicker of feeling registered in her eyes. No sheets here either, I see, she said in German to the guard. 
See that she has two by Friday. One to be changed every two weeks. The ice-cold eyes appraised me exactly as they had the bed. How many showers does the prisoner get? The guard wet her lips. About one a week. Washed and mushed and... One a week. One shower a month was closer. She will go twice a week. Sheets. Regular showers. Were conditions going to be better? The new head matron took two strides into the cell. She did not need the cot to reach the overhead bulb. Rip. Off came my red cellophane lampshade. She pointed to a box of soda crackers that had come and a second package from Nolly. No boxes in the cell, cried the little guard in the Dutch, as indignantly as though this had been a long-standing rule. Not knowing what else to do, I dumped the crackers out into the, onto the cot. At the matron's unspoken command, I emptied a bottle of vitamins and a sack of peppermint drops the same way. Unlike the former head matron who shrieked and scolded endlessly, endlessly in her rusted hinge voice, this woman worked in terrifying silence. With a gesture, she directed the guard to feel beneath the mattress. My heart wedged in my throat. My precious remaining gospel was hidden there. The guard knelt and ran her hand the length of the cot. But whether she was too nervous to do a thorough job or whether there was a more mysterious explanation... She straightened up, empty-handed, and then they were gone. I stood gazing numbly at the jumble of food on my cot. I thought of this woman reaching Bessie's cell, reducing it again to four walls and a prison cot. A chill wind was blowing through the Schrevenhagen, cleaning, ordering, killing. It was this tall, ramrod, straight woman who unlocked the door to my cell one afternoon in the second half of June and admitted Lieutenant Roms. At the severity in his face, I swallowed the greeting that had almost burst from me. You will come to my office, he said briefly. The notary has come. We might as well have been total strangers. Notary, I said stupidly, for the reader of your father's will. He made an impatient gesture. Obviously, this minor matter had interrupted a busy day. It's the law. Family present. When a will is open, family is present. Already he was heading from the cell and down the corridor. I broke into a clumsy run to keep up with the strides of the silent woman beside me. The law? What law? And since when he had the German occupation government concerned itself? And since when did the German occupation government concern itself with Dutch legal procedures? Family? Family present? No, don't let yourself think of it. At the door to the courtyard, the matron turned, erect and impassive, back along the corridor. I followed Lieutenant Roms into the dazzling early summer afternoon. He opened the door for me in the fourth hut. Before my eyes adjusted to the gloom, I was drowning in Willem's embrace. Corey! Corey! Baby sister! It was fifty years since he had called me that. Now Nolly's arm was around me too, the other one still clinging to Betsy as though by the strength of her grip she would not she would hold us together forever. Betsy, Nolly, Willem, I did not know which name to cry first. Tyne was in that little room too, and Flip, and another man. When I had time to look, I recognized the Harlem notary who had been called onto the watch shop's few legal consultations. He held each other. We held each other at arm's length to look. We babbled questions all at once. Betsy was thin and prison pale. But it was Willem who shocked me. His face was gaunt, yellow, and pain-haunted. He had come home this way from Schriegenbegen, Tyne told me. Two of the eight men crowded into this tiny cell had died of jaundice while he was there. Willem, I could not bear to see him this way. I cricked my arm through his, standing close so that I not have to look, look at him, loving the sound of his deep rolling voice. Willem did not seem aware of his own illness. His concern was all for kick. This handsome blonde son who had seized the month, who was seized 
the month before helping an American parachutist reach the North Sea. They believed he had been on one of the recent prison trains into Germany. As for father, they had learned a few more facts about his last days. He had apparently become ill in his cell and been taken by car to the municipal hospital in The Hague. There, no bed had been available. Father had died in a corridor, separated somehow from his records or any clue of his identity. Hospital authorities had buried the unknown old man in Popper's cemetery. The family believed they had located the particular grave. I glanced over at Lieutenant Roms. He was standing with his back to us as we talked, staring down at the cold, unlit stove. Swiftly I opened the package Nolly had pressed into my hand with the first embrace. It was what my leaping heart had told me. A Bible, the entire book in a compact volume, tucked inside a small pouch with a string for wearing around the neck as we had once carried our identity cards. I dropped it quickly over my head and down my back beneath my blouse. I couldn't even find words with which to thank her. The day before, in the shower line, I had given away my last remaining gospel. We don't know all of the details, William was saying in a low voice to Betsy. Just after a few days, the soldiers were taken off guard duty at the Beige and police stationed there instead. The fourth night, he believed, the chief has succeeded in assigning Rolf and another group to the same shift. They had found all the Jews well, though cramped and hungry, and seen them to a new hiding place. And now, I whispered back, they're all right now. Willem lowered his deep, sunk eyes to mine. He had never been good at concealing difficult truths. They're all right, Corey all except Mary. Old Mary Atali, he said, had been arrested one day walking down a city street where she had been going and why she had exposed herself this way in broad daylight nobody knew. The time is up, Lieutenant Roms left his persual of the stove and nodded to the notary. Proceed with the reading of the will. It was a brief, informal document. The Beji was to be home for Betsy and me as long as we wanted it. Should there be any money realized from the sale of the house or watch shop, he knew would we recall his equal love for us all he committed us with the joy to the constant care of God. In the silence which followed, we all suddenly bowed our heads. Lord Jesus, William said, we praise you for these moments together under the protection of this good man. How can we thank him? We have no power to do him any service. Lord, allow us to share this heritage from our father with him as well. Take him too and his family into your constant care. Outside, a guard's footstep sounded on the crunchy gravel walk. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12. Voot. Get your things together. Get ready to evacuate. Collect all possessions and pillowcases. The shouts of the guards echoed up and down the long corridor. I stood in the center of my cell in a frenzy of excitement. Evacuate? Then, then something was happening. We were leaving the prison. The counter invasion must have begun. I snatched the pillowcase from the little wad of straw I had stuffed it into. What ridges this coarse bit of muslin had been in the two weeks since it had been provided? A shield for my head from the scratch and smell of the bedding. It almost didn't matter that the promised sheets had never arrived. With trembling hands, I dropped my few belongings into it. The blue sweater. The pajamas. Covered now, back and front with embroidered figures. Toothbrush. Comb. A few remaining crackers wrapped in toilet paper. My Bible was in its pouch on my back where it remained, except when I was reading it. I put on my coat and hat and stood at the iron door, clutching the pillowcase in both hands. It was still early in the morning. The tin breakfast plate had not yet been removed from the shelf in the door. Getting ready had taken no time at all. An hour passed. I sat on the cot. Two hours. Three. It was warm in the cell this late June day. 
I took off my hat and coat and folded them next to me on the cot. More time passed. I kept my eyes on the ant hole, hoping for a last visit from my small friends, but they did not appear. Probably I had frightened them by my early morning dashing about. I reached into the pillowcase, took one of the crackers and crumbled it about the little crack. No ants. They were, they were staying safely hidden. And suddenly I realized that this too was a message. A last wordless communication among neighbors. For I too had a hiding place when things were bad. Jesus was this place. The rock cleft for me. I pressed a finger to the tiny crevice. The afternoon sun appeared on the wall and moved slowly across the cell. And then all at once there was a clanging out in the corridor. Doors scraped. Bolts banged. Out! Schneel! All out! No talking! I snatched up my hat and coat. The door screeched open. Form ranks of five. The guard was already at the next cell. I stepped out into the hall. It was jammed from wall to wall. I had never dreamed so many women occupied this corridor. We exchanged looks. Invasion, we mouthed silently. The soundless words sweeping through the massed women like an electric charge. Surely the invasion of Holland had begun. Why else would they be emptying the prison? Where would we be taken? Where were we headed? Not into Germany. Dear Jesus, not Germany. The command was given and we shuffled forward down the long, chill halls, each carrying a pillowcase with her belongings forming a little bulge at the bottom. At last we emerged into the wide courtyard inside the front gate of the prison, and another long wait began. But this wait was pleasant, with the late afternoon sun on our backs. Far to the right I could see the columns of the men's section, but crane my neck though I would, I could not see Betsy anywhere. At last the huge gate swung in and a convoy of great gray transport buses drove through. I was herded abroad, the third one. The seats had been removed. The windows painted over. The bus lurched dreadfully as it started up, but we were standing too close together to fall. When the bus ground to a stop, we were at a freight yard somewhere in the outskirts of the city. Again, we were formed into ranks. The guards' voices were tense and shrill. We had to keep our heads facing forward, eyes front. Behind us, we could hear buses arriving, then lumbering away again. It was still light, but I knew by the ache in my stomach that it was long past supper time. And then, ahead and to the left of me, in the newest group of arriving prisoners, I spotted a chestnut bun. Betsy! Somehow, some way, I was going to get to her. Now, instead of wanting the day to end, I prayed that we stay where we were until dark. Slowly the long June day faded. Thunder rumbled and a few drops of rain fell. At last, a long row of unlit coaches rolled slowly over the tracks in front of us. They banged to a stop, rolled forward a little farther and then stopped again. After a while, they began backing. For an hour or more, the train switched back and forth. By the time the order came to board, it was pitch dark. The ranks of prisoners surged forward. Behind us, the guards shouted and cursed. Obviously, they were nervous. They were nervous at transporting so many prisoners at one time. I wrinkled and shoved through the left. Elbows and shoulders were in my way, but I squirmed past. At the very steps of the train, I reached out and seized Betsy's hand. Together, we climbed into the train. Together, found seats in a crowded compartment. Together, wept tears of gratitude. The four months in Shrivenigan had been our first separation in 53 years. It seemed to me that I could bear whatever happened with Betsy beside me. More hours passed as the loaded train sat on the siding. For us, they flew. There was so much to share. Betsy told me about each of her cellmates, and I told her about mine and the little hole into which they scrambled at any emergency. As always, Betsy had given to others everything she had. The Bible that Nolly had smuggled to her she had torn up and passed around, book by book. It must have been two or three in the morning that the train at last began to move. We pressed our faces to the glass. 
but no light showed and clouds covered the moon. The thought uppermost in every mind was, is it Germany? At one point, we made out a tower that Bessie was sure to be the cathedral at Delft. An hour or more later, the clack of the train changed pitch. We were crossing a trestle, but a very long one. As the minutes passed, and still we had not reached the other side, Betsy and I exchanged looks. The Morgique Bridge. Then we were headed south, not east to Germany, but south to Brabant. For the second time that night, we wept tears of joy. I leaned my head back against the wooden slats of the seat and shut my eyes, reliving another train trip to Brabant. Mama's hand had gripped father's then, as the train swayed. Then, too, it was June, the June of the first sermon, of the garden back of the mounts, and Carol. I must have fallen asleep back in that other June, for when I opened my eyes, the train had stopped. Voices were shouting at us to move. Chanel! Abir Chanel! An eerie glare lit the windows. Betsy and I stumbled after the others along the aisle and down the iron steps. We seemed to have stopped in the middle of the woods. Floodlights mounted in trees lit a broad, rough-cleared path lined with soldiers with leveled guns. Spurred by the shouts of guards, Betsy and I started up the path between the gun barrels. Schneller! Close ranks! Keep up! Five abreast! Betsy's breath was coming short and hard, and still they yelled at us to go faster. It had rained hard here, for there were deep puddles in the path. Ahead of us, a white-haired woman stepped to the side to avoid one. A soldier struck her in the back with a gun butt. I took Betsy's pillowcase along with mine, hooked my other arm through hers and hauled her along beside me. The nightmare march lasted a mile or more. At last we came to a barbed wire fence surrounding a row of wooden barracks. There were no beds in the one we entered, only long tables with backless benches pulled up to them. Betsy and I collapsed onto one of these. Under my arm, I could feel the, ir feel the irregular flutter of her heart. We fell into an exhausted sleep, our heads on the table. The sun was streaming through the barracks windows when we woke up. We were thirsty and hungry. We had nothing to eat or drink since the early meal at Schrevenigen in the morning before. But all that day, no guard or any official person appeared inside the barracks. At last... When the sun was low in the sky, a prisoner crew arrived with a great vat of some thick, steamy substance that we gobbled ravenously. So I began our stay. So began our stay at this place that we learned was named Vogt, after the nearest small village. Unlike Schreveningen, it had been a regular Dutch prison. Vogt had been constructed by the occupation, especially as a concentration camp for political prisoners. We were not yet in the camp proper, but in a kind of quarantine compound outside. Our biggest problem was idleness, wedged together as we were around the long rows of tables with nothing to do. We were guarded by the same young woman who had patrolled the corridors at Schrevenigen. They had been adequate enough as long as we were behind locked doors. Here, they seemed at a loss. Their only technique for maintaining discipline was to shriek obscenities and hand out punishments to all alike half rations for the entire barracks, an extra roll call at rigid attention, a ban on talking for 24 hours. Only one of our overseers never threatened or raised her voice. This was the tall, silent head matron from Schrevenigen. She appeared in fault the third morning during the pre-dawn roll call, and at once something like order seized our rebellious and untidy ranks. Lines straightened, hands were clamped to sides, Whispers ceased as those cold blue eyes swept across us. Among ourselves, we nicknamed her the General. During one law roll call, a pregnant woman at her table slumped to the floor, striking her head against the edge of the bench. The General did not as much pause in her expressionless reading of names. We had been in this outer camp at Vault almost two weeks when Betsy and I, along with a dozen of others, were called out by name during the morning roll call. When the rest had been dismissed, 
The general distributed typewritten forms among us and instructed us to present them at the administration barracks at nine o'clock. A worker on the food crew, a long-term prisoner from the main camp, smiled encouragingly as he ladled out our breakfast. You're free, he whispered. Those pink forms mean release. Betsy and I stared disbelievingly at the sheets of paper in our hands. Free? Free to leave? Free to go home? Others crowded around, congratulating us, embracing us. The woman from Betsy's cell is riveting and wet unabashedly. How cruel to have, have to leave all these behind. Surely the war will be over very soon, we told them. We emptied our pillowcases, passing out our few belongings among those who had to stay. Long before nine o'clock, we were standing in the bidden, big wooden Attenham room of, of administration. At last, we were summoned to an inner office where our forms were examined, stamped, and handed over to a guard. We followed this man down a corridor into another office. For hours, the process continued as we were shuttled from one room, an official, to another, questioned, fingerprinted, sent on to the next post. The group of prisoners grew until there were forty or fifty of us standing in line behind a high anchor chain fence topped with barbed wire. On the other side of the fence was a white birch woods. Above our heads, the blue Brabant sky. We, too, belonged to that wide free world. The next barracks we entered held a row of desks with women clerks seated behind them. At one of these, I was handed a brown paper envelope. I emptied it into my hand, and the next moment was staring in disbelief at my Alfina watch. Mama's ring. Even my paper gilders. I had not seen these since the night we arrived at Shrevenhagen. Money? Why, that belonged to the world of shops and trolley cars. We could go to a train station with this money. Two fares to Harlem, please. We marched along a path between twisted rolls of bob wire and through a wide gate into a compound of low tin roof barracks. There were more lines, more weights, more shuffling from desk to desk, but already the camp and its procedures had become unreal to me. Then we were standing before a high counter, and a young male clerk was saying, Leave all personal effects at window mark C. But they just gave them back to me. Watches, perches, jewelry. Mechanically, like a machine with no will of its own, I handed watch, ring, and money through the small, barred window. A uniformed woman swept them into a metal box. Move along. Next. Then... We were not going to be released? Outside this building, a floored-faced officer formed us into a double column and marched us across a broad parade ground. At one end of it, a crew of men with shaved heads and striped overalls were digging a ditch. What did it mean? What did any of it mean? This whole long day of lines and waits? Betsy's face was gray with weariness. and She stumbled as we marched. Through another fence, we arrived in a yard surrounded on three sides by low concrete buildings. A young woman, in a military cape, was waiting for us. Prisoners halt, barked the red-faced officer. Explain to the newcomers, Fraulein, the function of the bunkers. The bunkers, the girl began in a broad voice of museum guide, offer the accommodation of those who fail to cooperate with camp rules. The rooms are cozy, if a bit small, about the size of a gym locker. To hasten the educational process, the hands are tied above the head. Even as the horrid recital continued, two guards came out of the bunkers carrying between them the form of a man. He was alive, for his legs were moving, but he seemed to have no conscious control over them. His eyes were sunken and rolled back in his head. Not everyone, the girl observed in the same detached drawl, seems to appreciate the accommodations at the bunkers. I seized Betsy's arm at the command to march. The command came again to march, more to steady myself than her. It was Father's train case once again. Such cruelty was too much to grasp, too much to bear. Heavenly Father, carry it for me. We followed the officer down the wide street lined with barracks on either side and halted at one of the gray, featureless sheds. It was the end of a long day of standing, waiting, hoping. We had simply arrived in the main camp at Vilk. The barracks appeared 
almost identical with the one we had left this morning, except this one was furnished with bunks as well as tables and benches, and still we were not allowed to sit. There was at last, while the matron and maddening deliberation checked off our documents against a list. Betsy, I wailed, how long will it take? Perhaps a long, long time, perhaps many years, but what, what better way could there be to spend our lives? I turned to stare at her. Whatever are you talking about? These young women, that girl at the back of the bunkers, Corey, if people can be taught to hate, they can be taught to love. We must find a way, you and I, no matter how long it takes. She went on, almost forgetting in her excitement to keep her voice to a whisper. Well, I slowly took in the fact that she was talking about our guards. I glanced at the matron seated at the desk ahead of us. I saw a gray uniform and a visored hat. Betsy saw a wounded human being. And I wondered... Not for the first time. What sort of a person she was, this sister of mine? What kind of road she followed while I trudged beside her on the all-too-solid earth? A few days later, Betsy and I were called up for work assignments. One glance at Betsy's pale face and fragile form, and the matron waved her contemptuously back inside the barracks, where the elderly and infirm spent the day sewing prison uniforms. The woman's uniform here in Volk was a blue overall with a red stripe down the side of the leg. Practical and comfortable. And a welcome change after our own clothes that we had worn since the day of our arrest. Apparently, I looked strong enough for harder work. I was told to report to the Phillips factory. This factory turned out to be no more than another large barracks inside the camp complex. Early in the morning, though it was... The tar beneath the shingled roof was beginning to bubble in the hot July sun. I followed my escort into the single large room where several hundred men and women sat along plank tables covered with thousands of tiny radio parts. Two officers, one male, one female, were strolling the aisles between the benches while the prisoners bent to their task. I was assigned a seat at a bench near the front and given the job of measuring small glass rods and arranging them in piles according to lengths. It was monotonous work. The heat from the roof pressed like a weight on my head. I longed to exchange at least last names and hometowns with my neighbors on the other side, but the only sound in the room was the clink of metal parts and the squeak of the officer's boots. They reached the door across from where I sat. Production was up again last week, the male officer said in German to a taller slender man with shaved head and striped uniform. You are to be commended for this increase. However, we continue to receive complaints of defective wiring. Quality control must improve. The shaved-headed man made an apologetic gesture. If there were more food, air officer, he murmured. Since the cutback in rations, I see a difference. They grow sleepy. They have trouble concentrating. His voice reminded me of a little Willems, deep cultivated with German, with only a trace of Dutch accent. Then you must wake them up, make them concentrate on the penalties. If the soldiers on the front can fight on half rations, rations and these lazy... At a terrible look from the woman officer, he stopped and ran his tongue over his lips. Uh, that is, I speak, of course, merely as an example. There is naturally no truth in the rumor that rations at the front are reduced, so so I hold you responsible. And together, they stalk from the building. For a moment, the prisoner foreman watched them from the doorway. Slowly, he raised his left hand and then dropped it with a slap to his side. The quiet room exploded. From under the tables appeared writing paper, books, knitting yarn, tins of biscuits. People left their benches and joined little knots of chattering friends all over the room. Half a dozen crowded around me. Who was I? Where was I from? Did I have any news of the war? After perhaps a half an hour of visiting among the tables, the foreman reminded us that we had a day's quota to meet and people drifted back to their places. The foreman's name, I learned, was Moorman. He had been headmaster of a Roman Catholic boys' school. 
He himself came over to my workbench the third day I was there. He'd heard that I had followed the entire assembly line through the barracks, tracing what became of my dull little piles of rods. You are the first woman worker, he said, who has ever shown any interest in what we're making here. I am very interested, I said. I'm a watchmaker. He stared at me with new interest. Then I have work for you that you will enjoy more. He took me to the opposite end of the huge shed where the final assembly of relay switches was done. It was intricate and exacting work, though not clearly so hard as watch repair, and Mr. Moorman was right. I enjoyed it, and it helped make the 11-hour workday go faster. Not only to me, but all the Phillips workers, Mr. Moorman acted as more as a kindly older brother than a crew boss. I would watch him, ceaselessly moving among his hundreds of charges, counseling, encouraging, finding a simpler job for the weary, a harder one for the restless. We had been at the vault more than a month before I learned that his 21-year-old son had been shot here at the camp the week Betsy and I arrived. No trace of this personal tragedy showed in his care for the rest of us. He stopped frequently at my bench the first two weeks, more to check my frame of mind than my work, but eventually his eyes would travel to the row of relay switches in front of me. Dear watch lady, can you not remember for whom you are working? These radios are for their fighter planes. And reaching across me, he would yank a wire from its housing or twist a tiny tube from an assembly. Now, solder them back wrong. And not so fast. You're over the day's quota, and it's not yet noon. Lunchtime would have been the best time of day I could have spent it with Betsy, if I could have spent it with her. However, Phillips workers were not allowed to leave the factory compound until the workday ended at 6 o'clock. Prisoners on kitchen detail lugged in great buckets of gruel, made of wheat and peas, tasteless but nourishing. Apparently, there had been a cutback in rations recently. Still, the food was better and more plentiful than the Schrevenigen, where there had been no noonday, no noonday meal at all. After eating, we were free for a blessed half hour to stroll about within the Phillips compound in the fresh air and the glorious Brabant sun. More days I had found a spot along the fence and stretched out on the warm ground to sleep. The days started with roll call at 5 a.m. Sweet summer smells came in the breezes from the farms around the camp. Sometimes I would dream that Carl and I were walking hand in hand along the country lane. At 6 a.m. At 6 p.m. in the evening, there was another roll call. Then we marched back to our various sleeping barracks. Betsy always stood in the doorway of ours waiting for me. Each evening was as though a week had passed. There was so much to tell one another. That Belgian boy and girl at the bench next to mine. This noon they became engaged. Miss Herma, whose granddaughter was taken to Germany, today she let me pray with her. One day, Betsy's nudes touched us directly. A lady from Amerlo was transferred to the sewing detail today. When I introduced myself, she said, Another one. What did she mean? Corey, do you remember the day we were arrested? A man came to the shop. You were sick and I had to wake you up. I remember very well. Remembering the strange roving eyes, the uneasiness in the pit of my stomach. That was more than fever. Apparently everyone in Armello knew him. He worked with the Gestapo from the first day of occupation. He reported this woman's two brothers for resistant work and finally herself and her husband too. When Armello had finally caught, a, caught on to him, he had come to Harlem and teamed up with Willems and Caitlin. Captain, his name was Van Vogel. Flames of fire seemed to leap around that name in my heart. I thought of father's final hours, alone and confused in a hospital corridor, of the underground work so abruptly halted. I thought of Mary Italia, arrested while walking down the street. And I knew that if Van Vogel stood in front of me now, I would kill him. Betsy drew the little cloth bag from beneath my overalls and held it out to me, but I shook my head. Betsy kept the Bible during the day, since she had more chance to read and teach from it here than I did at the Phillips barracks. 
In the evenings, we held a clandestine prayer meeting for as many as would crowd around our bunk. You lead the prayers tonight, Betsy. I have a headache. More than a headache. All of me ached with the violence of my feelings about the man who had done us so much harm. That night, I did not sleep, and the next day at my bench scarcely heard the conversation around me. By the end of the week, I had worked myself in such a, such a sickness of body and spirit that Mr. Mormon stopped at my bench to ask if something were wrong. Wrong? Yes, something's wrong. And I plunged into an account of that morning. I was only too eager to tell Mormon and all Holland how Van Vogel had betrayed his country. What puzzled me all this was Betsy. She had suffered everything I had, yet see, she seemed to carry no burden of rage. Betsy, I hissed one dark night when I knew that my restless tossing must be keeping her awake. Three of us now shared this single cot as the crowded camp daily received new arrivals. Betsy, don't you feel anything about Van Vogel? Doesn't it bother you? Oh, yes, Corey. Terribly. I have felt for him ever since I knew, and I pray for him whenever his name comes into my mind. How dreadfully he must be suffering. For, for a long time, I, I laid silent in the huge, shattery barracks, restless with the sighs, snores, and stirrings of hundreds of women. Once again, I had the feeling that this sister with whom I had spent my whole life belonged somehow to another order of beings. Wasn't she telling me in her gentle way that I was just as guilty as Van Vogel? Didn't he and I stand together before an all-seeing God convicted of the same sin of murder? For I had murdered him with my heart and with my tongue. Lord Jesus, I whispered into the lumpy ticking of the bed. I forgive Van Vogel as I pray that you will forgive me. I have done him great damage. Bless him now and his family. That night, for the first time since our betrayer had a name, I slept deep and dreamlessly until the whistle summoned us all to cold roll call. The days in Vuk were a very baffling mixture of good and bad. Morning roll call was often cruelly long. If the smallest rule had been broken, such as a single prisoner late for evening check-in, the entire barracks would be punished by a 4 a.m., or even a 3.30 a.m. call, and made to stand at parade attention until her backs ached and her legs cramped. But the summer air was warm and alive with the birds as the day approached. Gradually, in the east, a pink and gold sunrise would light the immense Brabant sky, and Betsy and I squeezed each other's hand in awe. At 5.30, we had black bread and coffee, bitter and hot, and then fell into marching columns for the various work details. I look forward to this hike to the Phillips factory. Part of the way we walked beside was small woods separated only by a row of barbed wire from a glistening world of dewdrops. We also marched past a section of the men's camp, many of our group straining to identify a husband or son among the ranks of the shaved heads and striped overalls. This was another of the paradoxes of Bach. I was endlessly, daily grateful to be again with people, but what I had not realized in solitary confinement was that to have companions meant to have their griefs as well. We all suffered with the woman whose men were in this camp. The discipline in the male section was much harsher than in the women's. Executions were frequent. Almost every day, a salvo of shots would send the anguished whispers flying. How many this time? Who are they? The woman next to me at the relay bench was an intense communist woman named Flor. She and her husband had managed to get their two small children to friends before they were arrested, but she worried aloud all day about them and about Mr. Flor, who had tuberculosis. He worked on the rope-making crew in the compound next to Phillips, and each noon they managed to exchange a few words to the barbed wire separating the two enclosures. Although she was expecting a third child in September, she would never eat her morning allotment of bread, but passed it through the fence to him. She was dangerously thin. 
I felt for an expected mother, and several times I brought her a portion of my own breakfast bread, but this, too, was always set aside for Mr. Floor. And yet, in spite of sorrow and anxiety, and no one in that place was without both, there was laughter, too, in the Phillips barracks, an impersonation of the pompous, blustering second lieutenant, a game of blind, blind man's bluff, a song passed in rounds from bench to bench until, thick clouds, thick clouds, the signal might come from any bench which faced a window. The factory barracks was set in the center of the broad Phillips compound, so there was no way a camp official could approach it without crossing this open space. In an instant, every bench would be filled, the only sound the business-like rattle of radio parts. One morning, the code words were still being relayed down the long shed when a rather hefty Offshaveran stepped through the door. She glanced furiously about face flushing scarlet as she applied thick clouds to her appearance. She shrieked and ranted for a quarter of an hour, then deprived us of our noontime break in the open air that day. After this, we adopted the more neutral signal. Fifteen. I've assembled fifteen dials. During the long, hot afternoon pranks and talk died down as each one sat alone with his own thoughts, I scratched on the side of the table with the number of days until September 1st. There was nothing official about that date, just a chance remark by Mrs. Floor to the effect that six months was the usual prison term for ration card offenders. Then, if that were the charge, if they would be included the time served at Shrevenigan, September 1 would be our release date. Corey, Betsy one warned me one evening when I announced triumphantly that August was half over. We don't know for sure. I had the feeling almost that to Betsy it didn't matter. I looked at her sitting on the cot in the last moments before lights out, sewing up a split seam in my overalls as she'd so often sat mending under the lamplight in the dining room. Betsy, by the very way she sat, evoked a high back chair behind her and a carpet at her feet instead of this endless row of metal cots on a bare pine floor. The first week we were here, she added extra hooks to the neck of her overalls so that she could fasten the collar high around her throat, and this propriety taken care of, I had the feeling she was as content to be reading the Bible here in bulk to those who had never heard it, as she'd been serving soup to hungry people in the half hallway of the Beji. As for me, I set my heart every day more firmly on September 1, and then all of a sudden, it looked as though we would not have to wait even this long. The Princess Irene Brigade was rumored to be in France, moving toward Belgium. The brigade was part of the Dutch forces that escaped to England during the Five-Day War. Now it was marching to reclaim its own. The guards were noticeably tense. Roll call was in agony. The old and the ill were slow, reaching their places, were beaten mercilessly. Even the red-light commando came in for discipline. These young women were ordinarily a favored group of prisoners, prostitutes, mostly from Amsterdam. They were in prison not for their profession, which was extolled as a patriotic duty, but for infecting German soldiers. Ordinarily, with the male guards anyway, they had a bold, breezy manner. Now even they had to form ruler straight lines and stand hours of frozen attention. The sound of the firing squad was heard more and more often. One lunchtime, when the bells sounded to return to work, Miss Floor did not appear at the bench beside me. It always took a while for my eyes to readjust to the dim factory after the bright sun outside. It was only gradually that I saw the hunk of black bread still resting at her place on the bench. There had been no husband to deliver it to. And so hanging between the hope and horror, we waited out the days. Rumor was all we lived on. The brigade was across the Dutch border. The brigade was destroyed. The brigade had never landed. Women who had stayed away from the whispered little prayer service around our cot now crowded close, demanding signs and predictions from the Bible. On the morning of September 1st, Miss Floor gave birth to a baby girl child lived four hours. Several days later, we awoke to the sound of distant explosions. 
long before the roll call whistle and tired barracks was up and milling about in the dark between the cots. Was it bombs? Artillery fire? Surely the brigade had reached Brabant. The very day they might be in vault. The scowls and threats of the guards when they arrived daunted us not at all. Everyone's mind had turned homeward. Everyone talked of what she would do first. The plants, with the, the plants would all be dead, said Betsy, but we'll get some cuttings from Nolly. We'll wash the windows so the sun can come in. At the Phillips factory, Mr. Mormon tried to calm us. Those aren't bombs, he said, and certainly not guns. That's demolition work. Germans. They're probably blowing up bridges. It means they expect an attack, but that it's but not that it's here. It might not come for weeks. This dampened us a bit, but as the blasts came closer and closer, nothing could keep hope down. Now they were so near, they hurt our ears. Drop your lower jaw, Mr. Mormon called down the long room. Keep your mouth open and it will save your eardrums. We had our midday meal inside the doors and wind with the doors and windows closed. We'd been working again for an hour, we're sitting at our benches. No one could work when the order came to return to the dormitories. With sudden urgency, women embraced husbands and sweethearts who worked beside them at the Phillips. Betsy was waiting for me outside our barracks. Corey, has the brigade come? Are we free? No, not yet. I don't know. Oh, Betsy, why am I so frightened? The loudspeaker in the men's camp was sounding the signal for roam call. No order was given here, and we drifted about aimlessly, listening as we scarcely knew for what. Names were being read through the men's speaker, though it was too far away to make them out. And suddenly an insane fear gripped the waiting women. A death-like silence now hung over both sides of the vast camp. The loudspeaker had fallen silent. We exchanged wordless looks. We almost feared to breathe. Then rifle fire split the air. Around us, women began to weep. A second volley. A third. For two hours, the executions went on. Someone counted. More than 700 male prisoners were killed that day. There was little sleeping in our barracks that night, and no roll call the following morning. About 6 a.m., we were ordered to, to collect our personal things. Betsy and I put our belongings into the pillowcases we had brought from Schrevenigen, toothbrushes, needles and thread, and a small bottle of Davidaman oil that had come in a Red Cross package. Nolly's blue sweater, which was the only thing we had brought with us when we left the quarantine camp ten weeks before. I transferred the Bible in its bag from Betsy's back to my own. She was so thin, it made a visible bump between her shoulders. We were marched into a field where soldiers were passing out blankets from the backs of open trucks. As we filed past, Betsy and I drew two beautiful soft new ones. Mine was white with blue stripes, Betsy's white with red stripes, obviously the property of some well-to-do family. About noon, the exodus from camp began. Through the drab streets of barracks we went, past the bunkers, through the maze of barbed compounds and enclosures and at last onto the rough dirt road through the woods down which we had stumbled that rainy night in June. Betsy hung hard to my arm. She was laboring for breath, as she always did when she had to walk any distance. March! Schneel! Double time! I slipped my arm between Betsy's shoulders and half carried her the final quarter mile. At last the path ended and we lined up facing the single track, over a thousand women standing toe to heel. Farther along, the men's section was also at the siding. It was impossible to identify individuals among the shave heads glistening in the autumn sun. At first, I thought our train had not come. Then I realized that these freight cars standing on the tracks were for us. Already, the men were being prodded aboard, clambering up over the high sides. We could not see the engine. Just this row of small, high-wheeled European boxcars stretching out of sight in both directions. Machine guns mounted at intervals on the roof. 
Soldiers were approaching the long, along the track, pausing at each car to haul open the heavy sliding door. In front of us, a gaping black interior appeared. Women began to press forward. Clutching our blankets and pillowcases, we were swept along with the others. Betsy's chest was still heaving oddly after the rapid march. I had to boost her over the side of the train. At first, I could make out nothing in the dark car. Then, in a corner, I saw a small, uneven shape. It was a stack of bread, dozens of flat black loaves piled on top of another. A long trip then. The small car was getting crowded. We were shoved against the back wall. Thirty or forty people were all that could fit in. And still the soldiers drove women over the side, cursing, jabbing with their guns. Shrieks arose from the center of the car, but still the press increased. It was only when eighty women were packed inside that door, thumped shut, and we heard the iron bolts driven into place. Women were sobby, and many fainted. Although in the tight wedged crowd there remained upright, just when it seemed certain that those in the middle must suffocate or be trampled to death, we worked out a kind of system where, by half sitting, half lying, with our legs wedged around one another, like members of a sledding team, we were able to get down on the floor of the car. Do you know what I'm thankful for? Betsy's gentle voice startled me in the squirming madhouse. I am thankful that Father is in heaven today. Father, yes, oh Father, how could I have wept? How could I have wept for you? The warm sun beat down in the motionless train and temperature in the packed car rose. The air grew foul. Beside me, someone was tugging at a nail in the ancient wood of the wall. At last it came free, and with a point she set to work, gouging the hole wider. Others around the sides took up the idea, and on a while, blessed whiffs of outside air began to circle about us. It was hours before the train gave a sudden lurch and began to move. Almost at once it stopped again, then again crawled forward. The rest of the day and into the night it was the same, stopping, starting, slamming, jerking. Once, when it were my turn, at the air hole, I saw in the moonlight trainmen carrying a length of twisted rail. Tracks ahead of me must be destroyed. I passed the news. Maybe they would not be able to repair them. Maybe we would still be in Holland when liberation came. Betsy's forehead was hot to my hand. The red light girl between those legs I, I was wedged squeezed herself into an even tighter crouch so that Betsy could lie almost flat across my lap. I dozed too from time to time, my head on the shoulder of the friendly girl behind us. Once I dreamed it was storming, I could hear the hailstone of Tante John's front windows. I opened my eyes. It was really hailing. I could hear it rattling against the side of the car. Everyone was awake now and talking. Another storm of hail, and then we heard of a burst, the burst of a machine gun fire on the roof of the train. It's bullets, someone shouted. They're attacking the train. Again we heard that sound, like tiny stones striking the wall, and again the machine guns answered. Had the brigade reached us at last? The firing died away. For an hour the train sat motionless, then slowly we crawled forward. At dawn, someone called out that we were passing through the border town of Emmerich. We had arrived in Germany. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13, Robinsbrook For two more incredible days and two more nights, we were carried deeper and deeper into the land of our fears. Occasionally, one of the loaves of bread was passed from hand to hand, but not even the most elementary provision had been made for the sanitation, and the air in the car was such that few could eat. And gradually, more terrible than the crush of bodies, the filth. The single obsession was something to drink. Two or three times when the train stopped, the door was slid open a few inches and a pail of water passed in, but we had become animals, incapable of plan or system. Those near the door got it all. At last, the morning of the fourth day, the train stopped again and the door was opened its full width. 
like infants on hands and knees. We crawled to the opening and lowered ourselves over the side. In front of us was smiling a blue lake. On the far side among the sycamore trees rose a white church steeple. The stronger prisoners hauled buckets of water from the lake. We, spr we drank enough. We drank through cracked and swollen lips. The train was shorter. The cars carrying the men had disappeared. Only a handful of soldiers, some of them looking no older than fifteen, were there to guard a thousand women. No more were needed. We could scarcely walk, let alone resist. After a while, they got us in to straggly columns and marched us off. For a mile, the road followed the shore of the lake, then left, left it to climb a hill. I wondered if Betsy could make it to the top. But the sight of trees and skies seemed to have revived her, and she supported me as much as I her. We passed a number of local people on foot in horse-drawn wagons. The children especially seemed wonderful to me, pink-cheeked and healthy. They returned my stares with wide-eyed interest. I noticed, however, that the adults did not look at us but turned their heads away as we approached. From the crest of the hill we saw it, like a vast scar on the green German landscape, a city of low gray barracks surrounded by concrete walls in which guard towers rose at intervals. In the very center, a square smokestack emitted a thin gray vapor into the blue sky. Ravensbrück. Like a whispered curse, the word passed through the lines. This was the notorious woman's extermination camp whose name we had heard even in Harlem. That squat concrete building, that smoke disappearing in the bright sunlight. No, I could not look at it. As Betsy and I stumbled down the hill, I felt the Bible bumping between my shoulder blades. God's good news. Was it to this world that he had spoken it? Now we were close enough to see the skull and crossbones posted on intervals on the walls to warn of the electrified wiring along the top. The massive iron gates swung in. We marched between them. Acres of soot-gray barracks stretched ahead of us. Just inside the wall was a row of waist-high water spigots. We charged them, thrusting hands, arms, legs, even heads under the streams of water, washing away the stench of the boxcars. A squad of women guards in dark blue uniforms rushed at us, hauling and shouting, swinging their short, hard crops. At last, they drove us back from the faucets and herded us down an avenue between barracks. This camp appeared far grimmer than the one we had left. At least in marches about vault, we had caught sights of fields and woods. Here, every vista ended in the same concrete barrier. The camp was set down in a vast man-made valley rising on every side to those towering, wire-topped walls. At last we halted, in front of us a vast canvas tin roof. No sides, covered an acre or more of straw-strewn ground. Betsy and I found a spot on the edge of this area and sank gratefully down. Instantly we were on our feet again. Lice! The straw was literally alive with them. We stood for a while, clutching blankets and pillowcases well away from the infested ground. But at last, we spread out our blankets over the squirming straw and sat on them. Some of the prisoners had brought scissors from vault. Everywhere beneath the huge tent, women were cutting one another's hair. A pair was passed to us. And of course, we must do the same. Long hair was folly in such a place. But as I cut Bessie's chestnut waves, I cried. Toward evening, there was a commotion at the end of the tent. A line of SSS guards was moving across it, driving women out from under the canvas. We scrambled to our feet and snatched up our blankets as they bore down upon us. Perhaps a hundred yards beyond the tent, the chase stopped. We stood about, uncertain what to do. Whether a new group of prisoners had arrived or what was the reason for driving us from the tent, no one knew. Women began spreading their blankets on the hard cinder ground. Slowly it dawned on Betsy and me that we were to spend the night here where we stood. 
We laid my blanket on the ground, stretched out side by side, and pulled hers over us. The night is dark, and I am far from home. Betsy's sweet soprano was picked up by voices all around us. Lead thou me on. We were waked. We were waked up sometime in the middle of the night by a clap of thunder and a deluge of rain. The blankets soaked through and water gathered in puzzle puddles beneath us. In the morning, the field was a vast sodden swamp. Hands, clothes, and faces were black from the cinder mud. We were still wringing water from our blankets when the command came to line up for coffee. It was not coffee, but a thin liquid of approximately the same color, and we were grateful to get it as we shuffled double file past the makeshift field kitchen. There was a slice of black, black bread for each prisoner, too. Then nothing more until we were given a ladle of turnip soup and small boiled potato late in the afternoon. In between, we were kept standing at rigid attention on the soggy parade ground where we had spent the night. We were near one edge of the huge camp here, close enough to the outer wall to see the triple row of electric wires running along the top. Two entire days we, we spent this way, stretching out again the second night right where we stood. It did not rain again, but ground but the ground and blankets were still damp. Betsy began to cough. I took Nolly's blue sweater from my pillowcase, wrapped it around her, and gave her a few drops of the vitamin oil. But by morning, she had agonizing intestinal cramps. Again and again throughout that second day, she had to ask the impatient women, want monitor at the head of our row for permission to go to the ditch that served a sanitary facility. It was the third night as we were getting ready to lie down again under the sky when the order came to report to the processing center for new arrivals. A ten-minute march brought us to the building. We inched along the corridor into a huge reception room, and there, under the harsh ceiling lights, we saw a dismal sight as each woman reached a desk. There were some officers. She had to lay her blanket, pillowcase, and whatever else she carried onto a growing pile of things. A few desks further along, she had to strip off every scrape of clothing, throw them onto a second pile, and walk naked past the scrutiny of a dozen SS men into the shower room. Coming out of the shower, she wore only a thin prison dress and a pair of shoes, nothing more. But Betsy needed that sweater. She needed the vitamins. Most of all, we needed our Bible. How could we live in this place without it? How could I ever take it past so many watchful eyes without the overalls covering it? We were almost at the first desk. I fished desperately in my pillowcase, drew out the bottle of vitamins, and closed my fist around them. Reluctantly, we dropped the other things on the heap that was fast becoming a mountain. Dear God, I prayed, you have gotten us this precious book. You have kept it hidden through checkpoints and inspections. You have used it for so many. I felt Betsy stagger against me and looked at her in alarm. Her face was white, her lips pressed tight together. The guard was passing by. I begged him in German to show us the toilets. Without so much as a glance, he jerked his head in the direction of the shower room. Timidly, Betsy and I stepped out of line and walked to the door of the big, dank-smelling room and now its row of overhead spigots. It was empty, waiting for the next batch of fifty naked and shivering women to be admitted. Please, I said to the SS guard to the door, where are the toilets? He did not look at me either. Use the drain holes, he snapped, and as we stepped inside, he slammed the door behind us. We stood alone in the room, where a few minutes later, we would return stripped even of the clothes on our backs. Here were the prison things, we were to put on, piled just inside the door. From the front and back of each otherwise ordinary dress, a large X had been cut out and replaced with cloth of another color. And then we saw something else, stacked in a far corner, a pile of old wooden benches. They were slimy with mildew, crawling with cockroaches, but, but to me they seemed the furniture of heaven itself. The sweater. Take the sweater off. I hissed, fumbling with the string in my back. 
Betsy handed it to me, and in an instant I wrapped it around the Bible and the vitamin bottle and stuffed the precious bundle between the benches. And so it was, then we were herded into that room ten minutes later. We were not poor, but rich. Rich in this new evidence of the care of him who was God, even of Ravensbrook. We stood beneath the spigots as long as the flow of icy water lasted, feeling it soften our lice-eaten skin. Then we clustered dripping wet around the heap of prison dresses, holding them up, passing them about, looking for approximate fits. I found a loose, long-sleeved dress for Betsy that would cover the blue sweater when she would have had a chance to put it on. I squirmed into another dress for myself, then reached behind the benches and shoved the little bundle quickly inside the neck. It made a bulge, so you could have seen across the grope mark. I flattened it out as best I could, pushing it down, tugging the sweater around my waist, but there was no real concealing it beneath the thin cotton dress. And all the while, I had the incredible feeling that it didn't matter, that this was not my business but God's, that all I had to do was walk straight ahead. As we trooped back out through the shower room door, the SS men ran their hands over every prisoner front and back and sides. The woman ahead of me was searched three times. Behind me, Betsy was searched. No hand touched me. At the exit door of the building was a second ordeal, a line of women guards examining each prisoner again. I slowed down as I reached them, but the officer getting in charge shoved me roughly by the shoulder. Move along, you're holding up the line. And so Betsy and I arrived at barracks eight in the small hours of that morning, bringing only the Bible, but a knowledge of the power of him whose story it was. There were three women already asleep in the bed assigned to us. They made room for us as best they could, but the mattress sloped, and I kept sliding to the floor. At last, all five of us lay sideways across the bed and managed to get shoulders and elbows arranged. The blanket was a poor, threadbare affair compared with the ones we had been give it, given up, but at least the overcrowding produced its own warmth. Betsy had put on the blue sweater beneath her long-sleeved dress and wedged now between me and the others. Her shivering gradually subsided, and she was asleep. I lay awake a while longer, watching a searchlight sweep the rear wall in long, regular arcs hearing the distant calls of soldiers patrolling the walls. Morning roll call at Ravensbrook came a half an hour earlier than at the Bach. By 4.30 a.m., we had to be standing outside in the black pre-dawn chill, standing at parade attention in blocks of 100 women, 10 wide, 10 deep. Sometimes after hours of this, we would gain the shelter of the barracks only to hear the whistle. Everybody out! Fall in for roll call. Barracks 8 was in the quarantine compound. Next to us, perhaps as deliberate warning to newcomers, were located the punishment barracks. From there, all day long and often into the night, came the sounds of hell itself. They were not the sounds of anger or any human emotion, but of cruelty altogether, detached. Blows landing in regu regular rhythm, screams keeping pace. We would stand in our ten deep ranks with our hands trembling at our sides, longing to jam them against our ears to make the sound stop. The instant of dismissal, we would mob, mob the door of the barracks eight, stepping onto each other's heels in our eagerness to get inside, to shrink the world back to understandable proportions. It grew harder and harder. Even within these four walls, there was too much misery, too much seemingly pointless suffering. Each day, something else failed to make sense. Something else grew too heavy. Will you carry this too, Lord Jesus? But as the rest of the world grew stranger, one thing became increasingly clear. And that was the reason the two of us were here why others should suffer, we were not shown. 
as for us, from morning until lights out, whenever we were not in ranks for roll call, our Baba was the center of an ever-widening circle of help and hope. Like waves clustered around a blazing fire, we gathered about it, holding our hearts to its warmth and light. The blacker the night around us grew, the brighter and truer and more beautiful burned the word of God. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I would look about as Betsy read, watching the light leap from face to face. More than conquerors. It was not a wish. It was a fact. And we knew it. We experienced it minute by minute. Poor. Hated. Hungry. We are more than conquerors. Not we, not we shall be. We are. Life in Ravensbrook took place on two separate levels, mutually impossible. One, the observable external life grew every day more horrible. The other, the life we live with God grew daily better. Truth upon truth, glory upon glory. Sometimes I would slip the Bible from its little sack with hands that shook. So mysterious it had become to me. It was new. It had just been written. I marveled sometimes that the ink was dry. I believed the Bible always, but reading it now had nothing to do with belief. It was simply a description of the way things were, of hell and heaven, of how men act and how God acts. I had read a thousand times the story of Jesus' arrest, how soldiers had slapped him, laughed at him, flogged him, now such happenings had faces and voices. Fridays, the recurrent humiliation of medical inspection, the hospital corridor in which we waited was unheeded, and a fall chill had settled into the walls. Still, we were forbidden even to wrap ourselves in our own arms, but had to maintain our erect hands at sides position as we filed slowly past a flagrance of grinning guards. How there would have been any pleasure in the sight of these stick-thin legs and hunger, bloated stomachs I could not imagine. Surely there is no more wretched sight than a human body unloved and uncared for. Nor could I see the necessity for the complete undressing. When we finally reached the examining room, a doctor looked down each throat. Another, a dentist, presumably, at our teeth. A third, in between each finger. And that was all. We trooped down, again down the long, cold corridor, and picked up our X-marked dresses at the door. But it was one of those mornings while we were waiting, shivering in the corridor, that yet another page in the Bible leapt into life for me. He hung naked on the cross. I had not known. I had not thought. The paintings, the carved crucifixes showed at least a scrap of cloth. But this, I suddenly knew, was the respect and reverence of the artist. But all, at the time itself, on that other Friday morning, there had been no reverence. No more than I saw in the faces around us now. I leaned toward Betsy, ahead of me in line. Her shoulder blades stood out sharp and thin beneath her blue, mottled skin. Betsy, they took his clothes, too. Ahead of me, I heard a little gasp. Oh, Corey, and I never thanked him. Every day the sun rose a little later. The bite took longer to leave the air. It will be better, everyone assured everyone else, when we move into permanent barracks. We'll have a blanket apiece, a bed of our own. Each of us painted into the picture her own greatest need. For me... It was a disciplinary where Betsy would get medication for her cough. There will be a nurse to sign to the barracks, I said so often that I convinced myself. I was doling out a drop of the Davidimon each morning into her piece of black bread, but how much longer would the small bottle last, especially, I, I would tell her, if you keep sharing it around every time someone sneezes? The move to permanent quarters came the second week in October. 
we were marched, ten abreast, along a wide cinder avenue, and then into a narrower street, a barracks. Several times the column halted while numbers were read out. Names were never used at the Ravensbrook. At last, Betsy's and mine were called. Prisoner 66729. Prisoner 66730. We stepped out of line with a dozen or so others and stared at the long gray front of Barracks 28. Half its windows seemed to have been broken and replaced with rags. A door in the center led us into a large room where two hundred or more women bent over knitting needles. On tables between them were piles of wooden socks in army gray. On either side of the doors opened into two still smaller rooms, by far the largest dormitories we had seen yet. Betsy and I followed a prisoner guide through the door at the right. Because of the broken windows, the vast room was in semi-twilight. Our noses told us first that the place was filthy. Somewhere plumbing had backed up. The bedding was soiled and rancid. Then, as our eyes adjusted to the gloom, we saw that there were no individual beds at all, but great square piers stacked three high. A wedge sides, side by side and end to end, with only an occasional narrow aisle slicing through it. We followed our guide single file. The aisle was not wide enough for two, fighting back the claustrophobia of these platforms rising everywhere above us. The tremendous room was nearly empty of people. They must have been on on various work crews. At last she pointed to a second tier in the center of a small block. To reach it we had to stand on the bottom level, haul ourselves up, and then crawl across three other straw-covered platforms to reach the one that we would share with. How many? The deck above us was too close to let us sit up. We lay back, struggling against the nausea that swept over us from the reeking straw. We could hear the women who had arrived with us finding their places. Suddenly I stat sat up, striking my back on the cross slats above. Something had pinched my leg. Fleas, I cried. Betsy, the place is swarming with them. We scrambled across the intervening platforms, heads low to avoid another bump dropped down to the aisle and etched our way to the patch of light. Here, and here another one, I wailed. Betsy, how can we live in such a place? Show us, show us how. It was said so matter-of-factly it took me a second to realize she was praying. More and more the distinction between prayer and the rest of life seemed to be vanishing for Betsy. Corey, she said excitedly, he's given us the answer. Before we asked, as he always does, in the Bible this morning, where was it? Read that part again. I glanced down the long dim aisle to make sure no guard was in sight and then drew the bile from, from its pouch. It was First Thessalonians, I said. We were on our third complete reading of the New Testament since leaving Schrigenwegen. In the feeble light, I turned the pages. Here it is. Comfort the frightened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to go do good to one another and to all. It seemed written expressly to Ravensbrook. Go on, said Betsy. That wasn't all. Oh, yes. To another, to one another, and to all. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. That's it, Corey. That's his answer. Give thanks in all circumstances. That's what we can do. We can start right now to thank God for everything about this new barrack. I stared at her and then around me at the dark, failed air room. Such as, I said, such as being assigned here together. I bit my lip. Oh, yes, Lord Jesus. Such as... You're, what you're holding in your hands. I looked down at the Bible. Yes, thank you, dear Lord, that there was no inspection when we entered here. Thank you for all the women here in this room who will meet you in these pages. Yes, said Betsy. Thank you for the very crowding here. 
since we're packed so close that many more will hear. She looked at me expectingly. Corey, she prodded. Oh, all right. Thank you for the jam, cram, stuff, pack, suffocating crowds. Thank you, Betsy went on sincerely, for the fleas and for... The fleas? This was too much. Betsy, there's no way even God can make me grateful for a flea. Give thanks in all circumstances, she quoted. It doesn't say in pleasant circumstances. Fleas are part of this place where God has put us. And so we stood between piers of bunks and gave thanks for fleas. But this time I was sure Betsy was wrong. They started arriving around soon after six o'clock, the women of Barracks 28, tired, sweat-stained, and dirty from the long forced labor details. The building, we learned, from one of our platform mates had been designed to hold 400. There were now 1,400 quartered here, and with more arriving weekly as concentration camps in Poland, France, Belgium, Austria, as well as Holland, were evacuated toward the center of Germany. There were nine of us sharing a particular square, designed for four, and some grumbling as the others discovered they would have to make room for Betsy and me. Eight acrid and overflowing toilets were served, served the entire room. To reach them, we had to crawl not only over our own bedmates, but over those on the other platforms between us, and the close aisle, always at the risk of adding too much weight to the already sagging slats and crashing down on the people beneath. It happened several times that first night. From somewhere in the room would come a splintering sound, a shriek, smothered cries. Even when the slats held, the least movement on the upper platform sent a shower of dust and straw over the sleepers below, followed by a volley of curses. In barracks eight, most of us had been Dutch. Here, there was not even a common language, and among exhausted, ill-fed quarrels erupted constantly. There was one raging now as the women sleeping nearest the windows slammed them shut against the cold. At once, the scores of voices demanded that they be raised again. Brawls were starting all up and down that side of the room, and we heard scuffling, slaps, sobs. In the dark, I felt Betsy's hand clasp mine. Lord Jesus, she said aloud, send your peace into this room. There has been too little praying here. The very walls know it, but where you come, Lord, the spirit of strife cannot exist. The change was gradual, but distant. One by one, the angry sounds let up. I'll make you a deal, the voice spoke German with a strong Scandinavian accent. You could sleep in here where it's warmer, and I'll take your place by the window. And add your lice to my own? But there was a chuckle in the answer. No, thanks. I'll tell you what, the third voice said as a, in a French burr. We'll open them halfway. That way we'll only be half frozen and then you'll only be half smothered. A ripple of laughter widened around the room at this. I lay back on the sour straw and knew there was one more circumstance for which I could give thanks. Betsy had come to Barracks 28. Roll call came at 4.30 a.m. Here is it had in quarantine. A whistle roused us at 4 a.m. when, without even shaking the straw from clothes and hair, the stampede began for the ration of bread and coffee in the center room. Last comers found none. The count was made in Lagerstrasse, the wide avenue leading to the hospital. There we joined the occupants of other barracks, some 35,000 at a time, stretching out sight in pale glow of street lamps, feet growing numb on the cold cinder ground. After roll call, work crews were called out. For weeks, Betsy and I were assigned to Siemens factory. This huge complex of mills and railroad terminals was a mile and a half from the camp. The Siemens Brigade, several thousand of us, marched out the iron gate beneath the charged wires into a world of trees and grass and horizons. The sun rose as we skirted the little lake. The gold of the late fall fields lifted our hearts. The work at Siemens, however, was sheer misery. Betsy and I had to push a heavy 
handcart to a railroad siding where we unloaded large metal plates from a boxcar and wheeled them to receiving gate at the factory. The grueling workday lasted eleven hours. At least at noontime we were given a boiled potato and some thin soup. Those who worked inside the camp had no midday meal. Returning to camp, we could barely lift our swollen and aching legs. The soldiers patrolling us bellowed and cursed, but we could only shuffle forward inches at a time. I noticed again how the local people turned their eyes another way. Back at the barracks, we formed yet another line. Would there never be an end to columns and weights to receive our ladle of turnip soup in the center room? Then as quickly as we as, as quickly as we could for the press of the people, Betsy and I made our way to the rear of the dormitory room where we held our worship service. Around our own platform area, there was not enough light to read the Bible, but back here a small light bulb cast a wan yellow circle on the wall, and here an ever-large group of women gathered. They were services like no other, these times in barracks 28, a single meeting might include a recital of the Magnificent in Latin by a group of Roman Catholics, a whisper hymn by some Lutherans, and a Soto Vos chant by Eastern Orthodox women. With each moment, the crowd around us would swell, packing the nearby platforms hanging over the edges until the high structures groaned and swayed. At last, either Betsy and I would open the Bible, because only the Hollanders could understand the Dutch text we would be translating aloud in German. And then we would hear the life-giving words passed back along the aisles in French, Polish, Russian, Czech, back into Dutch. They were little previews of heaven these evenings beneath the light bulb. I would think of Harlem, each substantial church set beside its wrought iron fits and its barrier of doctrine. And I would know again in the darkness God's truth shines most clear. At first, Betsy and I called these meetings with great timidity, but as night after night went by and no guard ever came near us, we grew bolder, so many now wanting to join us that we held a second service after evening roll call. There, on the Legerstraats, we were under rigid surveillance, guards in their warm wool caps marching constantly up and down. It was the same in the center of the room of the barracks, half a darden half a dozen guards or camp police always present, yet in the large dormitory room there was almost no supervision at all. We did not understand. Another strange thing was happening. The David Davidman bottle was continuing to produce drops. It scarcely seemed possible. Too small a bottle, so many doses a day. Now, in addition to Betsy, a dozen others on our pier were taking it. My instinct was always to hoard it. Betsy was growing so very weak, but others were ill as well. It was hard to say no to eyes that burned with fever, hands that shook with chill. I tried to save it for the very weakest, but even those soon numbered fifteen, twenty, twenty-five. And still, every time I tilted the little bottle, a drop appeared at the tip of the glass stopper. It just couldn't be. I held it up to the light, trying to see how much was left, but the dark brown glass was too thick to see through. There was a woman in the Bible, Betsy said, whose oil jar was never empty. She turned to it in the Book of Kings, the story of the poor widow of Zarephath, who gave Elijah a room in her home. The jar of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of Jehovah, which he spoke by Elijah. Well, but wonderful things happened all through the Bible. It was just one thing to believe that such things were possible thousands of years ago, another to have it happen now, to us, this very day. And yet it happened this day, and the next, and the next, until an odd little group of spectators stood around watching the drops fall into the daily meal rations of bread. Many nights I lay awake in the sh sh shower of straw dust from the mattress above, trying to fathom the marvel of supply lavished upon us. Maybe I whispered to Betsy, only a molecule or two really gets through that little pinhole, 
and then in the air it expands. I heard her soft laughter in the dark. <laughs> Don't try too hard to explain it, Corey. Just accept it as a surprise from Father who loves you. And then, one day mine pushed her way to us in the evening food line. Look what I've got for you. Min was a pretty Dutch woman we had met in Vault. She was assigned to the hospital and often managed to bring to Barracks 28 some stolen treasure from the staff room, a sheet of newspaper to stuff into a broken window, a slice of bread left untouched on a nurse's plate. Now we peered into the small cloth sack she carried. Vitamins, I cried, and then cast an amp apprehensive glance at the camp policeman nearby. Yeast compound, I whispered. Yes, she hissed back. There were several huge jars. I emptied each just the same amount. We gulped the thin turnip water, marveling at our sudden riches. Back at the bunk, I took the bottle from the straw. We'll finish the drops first, I decided. But that night, no matter how long I held it upside down or how hard I shook it, not another drop appeared. On the 1st of November, a coat was issued to each prisoner. Betsy's and mine were both of Russian made, possibly once trimmed with fur. Threads shown were something that had been torn from the collars and cuffs. Call-ups for the Siemens factory had ceased, and we speculated that it had been hit in one of the bombing raids that had been within the earshot almost nightly now. Betsy and I were put to work leveling some rough ground just inside the camp wall. This, too, was back-breaking labor. Sometimes I bent to lift my load, my heart cramped strangely. At night, spasms of pain gripped my legs. But the biggest problem was Betsy's strength. One morning, after a hard night's rain, we arrived to find the ground sodden and heavy. Betsy had never been able to lift much. Today, her shovelfuls were microscopic, and she stumbled frequently as she walked to the low ground where we dumped the loads. Schneller, a guard screamed at her. Can't you go faster? Why must they scream, I wondered as I sank my shovel into the black muck. Why couldn't they speak like ordinary human beings? I straightened slowly, the sweat drying on my back. I was remembering where we had first heard that this maniac sound. The Beiji and Tante John's rooms. A voice coming from the shell-shaped speaker. A scream lingering in the air even after Betsy had leapt to shut it off. Loafer! Lazy swine! The guard snatched Betsy's shovel from her hands and ran from group to group of the digging crew, exhibiting the handful of dirt that was all Betsy was able to lift. Look what Madame Baronis is carrying. Surely she will overexert herself. The other guards and even some of the prisoners laughed. Encouraged, the guard threw, threw herself into a parody of Betsy's faltering walk. A male guard was with our detail today, and in the presence of a man, the woman guards were always animated. As the laughter grew, I felt a murderous anger arise. The guard was young and well-fed. Was it Betsy's fault that she was old and starving? But to my astonishment, Betsy too was laughing. That's me, all right, she admitted, but you better let me totter along with my little spoonful or I'll have to stop altogether. The guard's plump cheeks went crimson. I'll decide who stops. And snatching the leather crop from her belt, she slashed Betsy across the chest and neck. Without knowing what I was doing, without knowing I was doing it, I had seized my shovel and rushed at her. Betsy stepped in front of me before anyone had seen. Corey, she pleaded, dragging my arm to my side. Corey, keep working. She tugged the shovel from my hand and dug it into the mud. Contemptuously, the guard tossed Betsy's shovel toward us. I picked it up, still in a daze. A red stain appeared on Betsy's collar. A welt began to swell on her neck. Betsy saw where I was looking and laid a bird-thin hand over the whip mark. Don't look at it, Corey. Look at Jesus only. She drew away her hand. It was sticky with blood. In mid-November, the rain started in earnest, 
chill, drenching day-long downpours that left beads of moisture even on the inside walls. The Lagerstrasse was never dry now. Even when the rain let up, deep puddles stood in the road. We were not allowed to step around them as the ranks were formed. Often we stood in water up to our ankles, and the night barracks reeked with rotting shoe leather. Betsy's cough began to bring up blood. We went to sick call at the hospital, but the thermometer registered only 102, not enough to admit her to the wards. Alas, for my fantasies of a nurse and a dispensary in each barracks, this large bell room, bare room in the hospital, was where all the sick in the camp had to assemble, often standing outside in the rain for hours just to get through the door. I hated the dismal place full of sick and suffering women, but we had to go back again and again for Betsy's condition was growing worse. She was not repelled by the room as I was. To her, it was simply a setting in which to talk about Jesus, as indeed was every place. Wherever she was, at work, in the food line, in the dormitory, Betsy spoke to those around her about his nearness and his yearning to come into their lives. As her body grew weaker, her faith seemed to grow bolder, and sick call was just such sick call was such an important place, Corey. Some of these people are at the very threshold of heaven. At last, one night Bessie's fever registered over the required 104. There was another long wait until the nurse appeared to lead her and a half a dozen others into the hospital proper. I stayed with them as far as the door to the ward and then made my way slowly back to the barracks. As usual, as I stood in the door of the dormitory, it reminded me most of the anthill. Some women were already asleep after the long work day, but most were stirring about, some waiting for a turn at the toilets, others picking lice off of themselves and their neighbors. I twisted and squirmed through the crowd aisles to the rear where the prayer service was just ending. Nights when Betsy and I reported to sick call, we left the Bible with Mrs. Willmaker, a saintly Roman Catholic woman from The Hague who could render the Dutch words in German, French, Latin, or Greek. Women crowded around me, asking after Betsy, how was she? How long would she have to stay? Lights out blew and the scramble in the bunks began. I hoisted myself to the middle tier and crawled across those already in place. What a difference since Betsy had come to this room, where before this had been the moment for scuffles and cursing. Tonight, the huge dormitory buzzed with sorry, excuse me, and no harm done. I found our section in the dark and squeezed into a spot in the middle. From the doorway, a searchlight swept the room, lingering on blocks where anything stirred. Someone's elbow dug into my back. Another woman's feet were two inches from my face. How was it possible, packed so close, to be so utterly and miserably alone? End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 The Blue Sweater In the morning, a cold, wet mist hung over the Lagerstraat. I was grateful that Betsy did not have to stand outside. All day the blanketing fog hung over Ravensbrook, an eerie day when sound was muffled and the sun never rose. I was on potato detail, one of a crew hauling baskets of potatoes two long stretches to be covered with dirt against the freezing weather ahead. I was glad of the hard physical work that drove some of the damp from my bones and for the occasional bite of a raw potato when guards were not watching. The next day, when the white pall still lay over the camp, my loneliness for Betsy became too much to bear. As soon as roll call was dismissed, I did a desperate thing. Mean had told me a way to get into the hospital without passing the guard post inside the door. A latrine at the rear, she said, had a very large window, too warped to close tight. Since no visiting was permitted in the hospital, relatives of patients often took this way of getting inside. In the dense fog, it was easy to get through the window unseen. I hoisted myself through it and then clapped my hand to my nose against the stinging odor. A row of lidless, doorless toilets stretched along one wall in the pool of their overflow. I dashed for the door, then stopped, my flesh crawling, 
Against this opposite wall, a dozen naked corpses lay side by side, on their backs. Some of the eyes were open, and seemed to stare unblinkingly at the ceiling. I was standing there, lead-footed with horror, when two men pushed through the door carrying a sheet of wrapped bundle between them. They did not even glance at me, and I realized they took me for a patient. I ducked around them into the hall and stood a moment, stomach nodding with the sight I had seen. After a while, I started aimlessly off to the left. The hospital was a maze of halls and doors. Already I was not sure of the way back to the latrine. What if the potato crew left before I got back? And then a corridor looked familiar. I hurried, almost running from door to door, at last the ward where I had left Betsy. No hospital personnel was in sight. I walked eagerly down the aisle of cots looking from face to face. Corey! Betsy was sitting up in a cot near the window. She looked stronger, eyes bright, a touch of color in her sucken cheeks. No nurse or doctor had seen her yet, she said, but the chance to lie still and stay indoors had already made a difference. Three days afterward, Betsy returned to Barracks 28. She still had received no examination or medicine of any kind, and her forehead, her forehead felt feverish to my touch, but the joy of having her back outweighed my anxiety. Best of all, as a result of her hospitalization, she was given permanent assignment to the knitting brigade. The women we had seen the very first day seated about the tables at the center of the room. This work was reserved for the weakest prisoners, and now overflowed into the dormitories as well. Those working in the sleeping rooms received far less supervision than those at the tables, and Betsy found herself with most of the day in which to minister to those around her. She was a lightning knitter who completed her quota of socks long before noon. She kept our Bible with her and spent hours each day reading from it aloud, moving from platform to platform. One evening I got back to the barracks late from a wood-gathering foray outside the walls. A light snow lay on the ground, and it was hard to find the sticks and twigs in which, to, which a small stove was kept going in each room. Betsy was waiting for me, as always so that we would wait through the food line together. Her eyes were twinkling. You're looking extraordinary pleased with yourself, I told her. You know we've never understood why we had so much freedom in the big room, she said. Well, I found out. That afternoon, she said, there's been a confusion in her knitting group about the sock sizes and they asked the supervisor to come and settle it. But she wouldn't. She wouldn't step through the door and neither would the guards. And you know why? Betsy could not keep the triumph from her voice. Because of the fleas. That's what she said. That place is crawling with fleas. My mind rushed back to our first hour in this place. I remembered Betsy's bowed head. Remembered her thanks to God for creatures I could see no use for. Though Betsy was now spared heavy outdoor labor, she still had to stand the twice daily roll call. As December temperatures fell, they became true endurance tests, and many did not survive. One dark morning, when ice was forming a halo around each street lamp, a feeble-minded girl two rows ahead of us suddenly soiled herself. A guard rushed at her, swinging her thick leather crop while the girl shrieked in pain and terror. It was always more terrible when one of these innocent ones was beaten. Still, the offshoren continued to whip her. It was the guard we had nicknamed the snake because of the shiny dress she wore. I could see now beneath her long wool cape glittering in the light of the lamp as she raised her arm. I was grateful when the screaming girl at last lay still on the cinder street. Betsy, I whispered when the snake was far enough away, what can we do for these people? Afterward, I mean, can't we make a home? For them and care for them and love them? Corey, I pray every day that we will be allowed to do this, to show them that love is greater. And it wasn't till I was gathering twigs later in the morning that I realized that I had been thinking of the feeble-minded and Betsy of their persecutors. Several days later, my entire work crew was ordered to the hospital for medical inspection. I dropped my dress into the pile just inside the door and joined the file of naked women. 
ahead of us. To my surprise, a doctor was using a stethoscope with all the deliberateness of a real examination. What is this for? I whispered to the woman ahead of me. Transport inspection, she hissed back, not moving her head. Munitions work. Transport? But they couldn't. They mustn't send me away. Dear God, don't let them take me away from Betsy. But to my terror, I passed one station after another. Heart, lungs, scalp, throat, and I was still in the line. Many were pulled out along the way, but those who renamed looked hardly stronger. Swollen stomachs, hollow chests, spindling legs. How desperate for manpower Germany must be. I halted before a woman in a soiled white coat. She turned to me around. She turned around to face a chart on the wall, her hand cold on my bare shoulder. Read the lowest line you can. Ah, uh, I, I can't seem to read any of them. Lord, forgive me. Just the top letter. That big E, the top letter, was an F. The woman seemed to see me for the first time. You can see better than that. Do you want to be rejected? At Ravensworth, munitions transport was considered a privilege. Food and living conditions in the factories were said to be far better than here in the camp. Oh, yes, doctor, my sister. My sister's here at Ravensburg. She's not well. I, I can't leave her. The doctor sat down at a table and scrawled something on a piece of paper. Come back tomorrow to be fitted for glasses. Catching up to the line, I unfolded the small blue piece of paper. Prisoner 66730 was instructed to report for an optical fitting at 6.30 the following morning. 6.30 was the time the transport convoys were loaded. And so, as the huge fans rumbled down the Lagerstrasse the next day, I was standing in a corridor of the hospital waiting my turn at the eye clinic. The young man in charge was perhaps a qualified eye doctor, but his entire equipment consisted of a box of framed glasses from, from gold rim bifocals to a plastic framed child's pair. I found none that fitted, and at last was ordered back to my work detail. But of course, I had no work assignment, having been marked down for transport. I walked back uncertainly toward Barracks 28. I stepped into the center of the room. The supervisor looked over the heads of the knitting crew. Number, she said. I gave it, and she wrote it in a black-covered book. Pick up your yarn and pattern sheet, she went on. You'll have to find a place on one of the beds. There's no room here. And she turned back to the pile of finished socks on the table. I stood blinking in the center of the room, then grabbing a skein of the dark gray wool, I dashed through the dormitory door. And thus began the closest, most joyous weeks of all the time in Revensburg, side by side, in the sanctuary of God's fleas. Betsy and I ministered the word of God to all in the room. We sat by deathbeds that became doorways of heaven. We watched women who had lost everything grow rich in hope. The knitters of Barracks 28 became the praying heart of the vast diseased body that was Ravensbrook, interceding for all in the camp, guards under Betsy's prodding as well as prisoners. We prayed beyond the concrete walls for the healing of Germany, of Europe, of the world, as Mama had once done from the prison of a crippled body. And as we prayed, God spoke to us about the world after the war. It was extraordinary. In this place where whistles and loudspeakers took the place of decisions, God asked us what we were going to do in the years ahead. Betsy was always clear about the answer for her and me. We were to have a house, a large one, much larger than the Beiji, to which people who had been damaged by concentration camp life would come until they felt ready to live again in the normal world. It's such a beautiful house, Corey. The floors are all inlaid wood, with statues set in the walls, and a broad staircase sweeping down, and gardens, gardens all around it where they can plant flowers. It will do them such good, Carrie, Corey, to care for the flowers. I would stare at Betsy in amazement as she talked about these things. She spoke always as if though she were describing things she saw, as if that wide, winding staircase in those bright gardens were the reality, this cramped and filthy barracks the dream. But it wasn't a dream. It was really achingly, endlessly true, and it was always during roll calls that the 
accumulated misery threatened to overwhelm me. One morning, three women from Barracks 28 lingered inside a few minutes to avoid the cold. All the following week, the entire barracks was punished by an extra hour at attention. The lights on the Lagerstrasse were not even lit when we were driven from our bunks at 3.30 a.m. It was during this pre-inspection lineup one morning that I saw what I had till then refused to believe. Headlights appeared at the far end of the long street, wavering over the snow. Trucks with open flatbeds in the rear were approaching, spattering slush as they passed. They pulled up at the front door of the hospital. The door opened, and a nurse appeared, supporting an old woman whose legs buckled as she limped down the steps. The nurse lifted her gently onto the back of a truck. They were pouring out of the door now, leaning on the arms of nurses and hospital helpers. The old, the ill, last of all came orderlies with stretchers between them. Our eyes took in every detail of the scene. Our brains refused. We had known, of course, that when overcrowding reached a certain point, the sickest were taken to the brick building at the foot of the great square smoke stack. But that these women here in front of us, these very ones, it was not possible. Above all, I could not put it together with the kindly behavior of the nurses. That one in the truck just ahead, bending solicitously and tenderly over her patient. What was passing through her mind just now? And all the while, it grew colder. One night during evening roll call, a platoon somewhere far down the Lagerstrasse began a rhythmic stamping. The sound grew as others picked it up. The guards did not stop us, and at last the entire street was marching in place, pounding tattered shoes against the frozen ground, driving circulation back into the numb feet and legs. From now on, this was the sound of roll call the stamping of thousands of feet on the long, dark street. And as the cold increased, so did the special temptation of concentration camp life, the temptation to think only of oneself. It took a thousand cunning forms. I quickly discovered that when I maneuvered our way toward the middle of the roll call formation, we had a little protection from the wind. I knew this was self-centered. When Betsy and I stood in the center, someone else had to stand on the edge. How easy it was to give it other names. I was acting only for Betsy's sake. We were in an important ministry and must keep well. It was colder in Poland than in Holland. These Polish women probably were not feeling the chill the way we were. Selfishness had a life of its own. As I watched Mean's bag of yeast compound disappear, I began taking it from beneath the straw only after lights out when others would not see and ask for some. Wasn't Betsy's help more important? You see, God, she can do so much more for them. Remember that house after the war? And even when it wasn't right, it wasn't so very wrong, was it? Not wrong like sadism or murder and the other monstrous evils we saw at Ravensbrook every day. Oh, this was the great ploy of Satan in that kingdom of his to display such blatant evil that one could almost believe one's own secret sins didn't matter. The cancer spread. The second week in December, every occupant of Eric's 28 was issued an extra blanket. The next day, a large group of evacuees arrived from Czechoslovakia. One of them assigned to our platform had no blanket at all, and Betsy insisted that we give her one of ours. So that evening, I lent her a blanket, but I didn't give it to her. In my heart, I held on to the right to that blanket. Was it coincidence that joy and power imperceptibly drained from the ministry? My prayers took on a mechanical ring. Even Bible reading was dull and lifeless. Betsy cried to take over for me, but her cough made reading aloud impossible. So I struggled on with worship and teaching that it ceased to be real until one drizzly raw afternoon when just a lit enough light came through the window to read by, I came to Paul's account of his thorn in the flesh. Three times he said he begged God to take away his weakness, whatever it was. 
and each time God had said, rely on me. At least Paul concluded, the words seemed to leap from the page, that this very weakness was something to give thanks for, because now Paul knew that none of the wonders and miracles which followed his ministry could be done due to his own virtues. It was all Christ's strength, never Paul's. And there it was, a true blaze like sunlight, a truth blazed like sunlight in the shadows of Barracks 28. The real sin I had been committing was not that of inching toward the center of the platoon because I was cold. The real sin lay in thinking that any power to help and transform came from me. Of course, that is not my wholeness, but Christ that made the difference. The short winter day was fading. I could no longer separate the words on the page, and so I closed the Bible and to that group of women clustering close, I told the truth about myself, my self-centeredness, my stinginess, my lack of love. That night, real joy returned to my worship. Each roll call, the wind seemed sharper. Whenever she could, Mean smuggled newspapers from the staff room at the hospital, which we placed inside our clothes. Nolly's blue sweater beneath Betsy's dress was black with newsprint. The cold seemed to be affecting Betsy's legs. Sometime in the morning she could not move them at all, and two of us would have to carry her between us. It was not hard. She weighed no more than a child. But she could no longer stamp her feet as the rest of us did to keep the blood flowing. When we returned to the dormitory, I would rub her feet and hands, but my own. Only picked up the chill from hers. It was the week before Christmas that Betsy woke up unable to move either legs or arms. I shoved my way through the crowded aisles to the center room. The snake was on duty. Please, I begged. Betsy is ill. Oh, please, she's got to get to the hospital. Stand at attention. State your number. Prisoner 66730 reporting. Please, my sister is sick. All prisoners must report for the count. If she's sick, she can register at Sixth Hall. Mary Kay de Groff, a Dutch woman on the tier above ours, helped me form a cradle with our arms and carry Betsy outside. The rhythmic stamping had already begun at the Lagerstrasse. We carried her to the hospital, then stopped. In the light of the street lamps, the sick call line stretched to the edge of the building and out of sight around the corner. In the sooty snow alongside, three bodies lay where they had fallen. Without a word, Marky and I turned and carried our load back to the Lagerstrasse. After roll call, we got her back into bed. Her speech was slow and blurred, but she was trying to say something. A, a camp, Corey, a concentration camp. But we're in charge. I had been very close to here. The camp was in Germany. It was no longer a prison, but a home where people who had been warped by this philosophy of hate and force could come and learn another way. There were no walls, no barbed wire, and the barracks had window boxes. It will be good for them, watching things grow. People can learn to love from flowers. I knew by now which people she meant. The German people. I thought of the snake standing in the barrack store that morning. State your number. All prisoners must report for the count. I looked into Betsy's shrunken face. We are to have this camp in Germany instead, Betsy? Instead of the big house in Holland? Oh no, she seemed shocked. You know, we have the house first. You know we have the house first. It's ready and waiting for us. Such tall, tall windows. The sun is streaming in. A coughing fit seized her when finally she lay still. A strain of blood blackened the straw. She dozed fitfully during the day and night that followed, waking several times with the excitement of some new detail about her work in Holland or Germany. The barracks are gray, Corey, but we'll paint them green. Bright, light green like springtime. We'll be together, Betsy? 
We're doing all this together. You're sure about that? Always together, Corey, you and I. Always together. When the siren blew the next morning, Marky and I again carried Betsy from the dormitory. The snake was standing at the street door. As we started through it, with our fragile burden, she stepped in front of us. Take her back to the bunks. I thought, all prisoners, take her back. Wonderingly, we, re we replaced Betsy on the bed. Sleet rattled against the windows. Was it possible that the atmosphere of Barracks 28 had affected even this cruel guard? As soon as roll call was dismissed, I ran back to the dormitory. There, beside our bed, stood the snake. Beside her, two orderlies from the hospital were setting down a stretcher. The snake straightened almost guiltily as I approached. Prisoner is ready for transfer, she snapped. I looked at the woman more closely. Had she risked fleas and lice to spare Betsy the sick call line? She did not stop me as I stared after the stretcher. She didn't stop me as I started after the stretcher. Our group of knitters was just entering the big room. As we passed, a Polish friend dropped to her knees and made the sign of a cross. Sleet stung us as we reached the outside. I stepped close to the stretcher to form a shield for Betsy. We walked past the waiting line of sick people, through the door and into a large ward. They placed the stretcher on the floor, and I leaned down to make out Betsy's words. Must tell people what we have learned here. We must tell them that there is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still. They will listen to us, Corey, because we have been here. I stared at her wasted form. But when all of this hap when will all of this happen, Betsy? Now, right away, oh, very soon, by the first of the year, Corey, we will be out of this prison. A nurse had caught sight of me. I backed to the door of the room and watched as they placed Betsy on a narrow cot close to the window. I ran around to the outside of the building. At last, Betsy caught sight of me. We exchanged smiles and soundless words until one of the camp police shouted at me to move along. About noontime, I put down my knitting and went out to the center room. Prisoner 66730 reporting. Request permission to visit the hospital. I stood ramrod straight. The snake glanced up, then scrawled out a pass. Outside, it was still sleeting. I reached the door of the ward, but the horrible nurse would not let me enter even with my pass. So I went again to the window next to Betsy's cot. I waited until the nurse left the room, then tapped gently. Betsy's eyes opened. Slowly she turned her head. Are you all right? I formed with my lips. She nodded. You must get a good rest, I went on. She moved her lips in reply, but I could not follow. She formed the words again. I bent my head to one side, level with hers. The blue lips opened again. So much work to do. The snake was off duty during the afternoon and evening, and though I was asked, I asked the other guards repeatedly, I, I'd not get permission to leave. The minute roll call was dismissed the following morning, I headed for the hospital, permission or no. I reached the window and cut my hands to peer in. A nurse was standing directly between me and Betsy. I ducked out of sight, waited a minute, and then looked again. A second nurse had joined the first, both now stare at standing where I wanted to see. They stepped to the head and foot of the bed. I gazed curiously at what lay on it. It was a carving in old yellow ivory. There was no clothing on the figure. I could see no... I could see each ivory rib and the outline of the teeth through the parch parchment cheeks. It took me a one moment to realize it was Betsy. The nurses had each seized two corner of the sheet. They lifted it between them and carried the bundle from the room before my heart had started to beat again in my chest. Betsy, but she has so much to do. She could not. Where were they taking her? Where had they gone? 
I turned from the window and began running along the side of the building, chest hurting me as I breathed. Then I remembered the washroom, that window at the rear. That was where my feet carried me mechanically around to the back of the building, and there, with my hand on the window seal, I stopped. Suppose she was there. Suppose they had laid Betsy on that floor. I started walking again. I walked for a long time, still with that pain in my chest. And each time, my feet took me back to the washroom window. I would not go in. I would not look. Betsy could not be there. I walked some more. Strangely enough, although I passed several camp police, no one stopped to question me. Corey, I turned around to see Maine running after me. Corey, I've looked for you everywhere. Oh, Corey, come. She seized my arm and drew me toward the back of the hospital. When I saw where she was headed, I wrenched my arm free. I know, Mean, I know already. She didn't seem to hear. She seized me again, led me to the washroom window, and pushed me in ahead of her. In the reeking room stood a nurse. I drew back in alarm, but Mean was behind me. This is the sister, Mean said to the nurse. I turned my head to the side. I would not look to the bodies that lined the far wall. Mean put an arm around my shoulder and drew me across the room till we were standing above the heartbreaking row. Corey, do you see her? I raised my eyes to Bessie's face. Lord Jesus, what have you done? Oh, Lord, what are you saying? What are you giving me? For there lay Betsy, her eyes closed as if in sleep, her face full and young. The care lines, the grief lines, the deep hollows of hunger and disease were simply gone. In front of me was the Betsy of Harlem, happy and at peace, stronger, freer. This, this was the Betsy of heaven bursting with joy and health. Even her hair was graciously in place as if an angel had ministered to her. At last I turned wonderfully to mean. The nurse went silently to the door and opened it for us herself. You can leave through the hall, she said softly. I looked once more at the radiant face of my sister, then mean and I left the room together. A pile of clothes was heaped outside in the hallway. On top lay Nolly's blue sweater. I stooped to pick it up. The sweater was threadbare and stained with newsprint, but it was a tangible link with Betsy. Mean seized my arm. Don't touch those things. Black lice. They'll all be burned. And so I left behind the last physical tie. It was just as well. It was better. Now what tied me to Betsy was the hope of heaven. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 The Three Visions The beauty of Betsy's face sustained me over the next days as I went from one to another of the women who had loved her, describing to them her peace and her joy. The two mornings after her death, the Count was off at roll call. The other two barracks were dismissed. Twenty-eight remained in ranks, eyes front. The loudspeaker beeped and a voice came on. A woman was missing. The entire barracks would stand on the Lagerstrasse until she was found. Left, right, left, right, endlessly tramping to the drill of the chill from weary legs. The sun came up. A wan, wintry sun that did not warm. I looked down at my feet. My legs and ankles were swelling grotesquely. By noontime, there was no feeling in them. Betsy, how happy you are today. No cold, no hunger, nothing between you and the face of Jesus. The dismissal order came in the afternoon. We learned later that the missing woman had been found dead on one of the upper platforms. It was the following morning when over the loudspeaker during roll call came the words, Ten Boom, Cornelia. For an instant, I stood stupidly where I was. I had been 
prisoner 66730 for so long that I had almost failed to react to my name. I walk forward. Stand to the side. What is going to happen? What had I been singled out for? Had someone reported the Bible? The roll call dragged on. From where I stood, I could see almost the entire Lagerstrasse. Tens of thousands of women stretching out of sight, their breath hanging white in the night air. The siren blew for dismissal. The guard signaled me to follow her. I splashed through the slush, trying to keep up with the strides of her tall boots. My legs and feet were still painfully swollen from the long count the day before. My shoes were held together with bits of string. I hobbled behind the guard into the administration barracks at the opposite end of the Lagerstrasse from the hospital. Several prisoners were standing in line at a large desk. An officer seated behind it stamped a paper and handed it to the woman in front of me. Eatslassen, he said. Eatslassen? Released? Was, was the woman free then? Was this, were we all? He called a name and another prisoner stepped to the desk. A signature, a stamp. Eatslassen. At last, ten boom, Cornelia was called. I stepped to the desk, steadying myself against it. He wrote, brought down the stamp, and then I was holding it in my hand, a piece of paper with my name and birth date on it, and across the top in large black letters, Certificate of Discharge. Dazed, I followed the others through a door at our left. There, at another desk, I was handed a railway pass entitling me to transportation through Germany to the Dutch border. Outside this office, a guard pointed me down the corridor into still another room. There, the prisoners who had been ahead of me were tugging their dresses over their heads and lining up against the rear wall. Clothing over here, a smiling prison trustee told me. Entlassen, physical, she explained. I drew the Bible over my head, along with the dress, rolled them together, and buried the bundle at the bottom of the clothing pile. I joined the others, the wooden wall rough against my bare back. Strange how the very word release had made the procedures of prison a hundred times more hateful. How often Betsy and I had stood like this, but the thought of freedom had stirred in me and the shame of this inspection was greater than all the others. At last the doctor arrived, a freckled-faced boy in a military uniform. He glanced along the line of an undisguised contempt. One by one, we had to bend, turn around, spread our fingers. When he reached me, his eyes traveled down to my feet. His lips puckered in disgust. Edema, he said, hospital. He was gone. With one other woman who had not passed, I scrambled back in my clothes and followed the trustee from the building. Day had broken, a soul and gray sky spitting snow. We started up the Lagerstrasse, past the endless streets of barracks. Then, we're not. Aren't we going to be released? I imagine you will be as soon as the swelling in your legs goes down, the trustee said. The only release, if you're in good condition. I saw her look in the other prisoner. The woman's skin and eyes were a dull, dark yellow. Sick call stretched out the side of the hospital, but we walked straight through the door and into a ward at the rear. The room was crammed with double-decker cots. I was assigned a place on the upper bunk next to a woman whose body was covered with erupting pustules. But at least it was near a wall where I could keep my swollen legs elevated. That was what mattered now, to get the swelling down, to pass the inspection. Whether the ray of freedom shed a new, relentless light on Ravensbrook, or whether this was truly the most savage place yet, I could not tell. Suffering was unimaginable. Around me were survivors of a prison train which had been bombed on its way here. The women were horribly mutilated and in a terrible pain. But at each moan, two of the nurses jeered and mimicked the sounds. Even in the other patients, I saw the stony indifference to others. That was the most fatal disease of the concentration camp. I felt it spread to myself. How could one survive if one kept on feeling? The paralyzed and the unconscious kept falling out of the crowded narrow cots. That first night, four women fell from the upper bunks and died on the floor. It was better to narrow the mind to one's own need, not to see, not to think. But there was no way to shut up the sounds all night. Women cried out in German, a word I didn't know. Schreiber, 
over and over, rasping throats. Schreiber. Finally, I realized that where they were calling for bedpans, it was out of question for most of the women in this room to make it to that filthy latrine next door. At last, reluctant to lower my legs, I climbed down from my cot and set about the chore. The gratitude of the patients was heart-wrenching. Who are you? Why are you doing this? As though cruelty and callousness were the norm, ordinary decency the marvel. As a wintry dawn crept through the windows, I realized it was Christmas Day. I went each morning to the clinic at the front of the hospital where I would hear the tramping feet of the Lagerstrom outside. Each time the verdict was edema of the feet and ankles. Many of those who attended the clinic were like myself, discharged prisoners. Some had been released months ago. Their discharge papers and railway passes were ragged from opening and refolding. And what if Betsy were still alive? Surely our prison term would have been up together. But Betsy would never, never have passed the physical. What if she were here with me? What if it were I to pass the inspection and she? There are no ifs in God's kingdom. I would hear her soft voice saying it. His timing is perfect. His will is our hiding place. Lord Jesus, keep me in your will. Don't let me go bad by poking outside of it. I kept looking for someone to give the Bible to. How easy it would be back in Holland to get another, a hundred others. There were not many Hollanders in the word who would be able to read the Dutch text. But I last it slipped around my neck of a grateful young woman from Utrecht. The sixth night I spent in the ward, both bedpans were suddenly and mysteriously missing. In an upper bunk on the center aisle were two Hungarian gypsies whose muttering was part of the babble of the room. I never walked past their cot because one of them had a gangrenous foot, which she would thrust in the face of anyone who came near. Now someone screamed out that the gypsies had the bedpans, hidden under their blankets to save them the trip to the toilets. I went to their cot and pleaded with them, though I did not know whether they understood German or not. Suddenly the dark, in the dark, something wet and sticky coiled around my face. The woman had taken the bandage from her foot and flung it at me. I ran sobbing down the corridor and washed and washed beneath the wall spigot in the latrine. I would never step into that aisle again. What did I care about the wretched bedpans? I couldn't bear. But of course, I did go back. I had learned much in the past year about what I could and could not bear. As the gypsies saw me heading down the aisle toward them, both bedpans clattered onto the floor. The next morning, the doctor on duty at the clinic stamped the medical approval of my discharge form. Events that had dragged so slow now moved with bewildering speed. In a dressing shed near the outer gate of the camp, I was outfitted with clothes, under things, a woolen shirt, a truly beautiful silk blouse, sturdy, almost new shoes, a hat, an overcoat. I was handed a form to sign stating that I had never been ill at the Ravensburg, never had an accident, and that the treatment had been good. I signed. In another building, I received a day's bread, ration, and food coupons for three additional days. I was also given back my watch, my Dutch money, and Mama's ring. And then I was standing with a group of ten or twelve just inside the gate. The heavy iron doors swung open. At the heels of a woman guard, we marched through. We climbed the little hill. Now I could see the lake, frozen from shore to shore. Pines in the distant church steeple sparkled in the winter like an old-fashioned Christmas card. I could not believe it. Perhaps we were only going to the Siemens factory. Tonight we would march back to camp. But at the top of the hill we turned left and toward the center of a small town. I could feel my feet swelling in the tight new shoes, but I bit my lip and made myself stride along. I imagined the guard turning around, pointing a scornful finger, finger, Adema, send her back to the camp. At the small train station, the guard turned and left us without a backward glance. Apparently, we were all traveling as far as Berlin, then each pursuing her separate route home. There was a long wait on cold iron benches. The feeling of unreality persisted. Only one thing seemed familiar. The hungry hollow in my stomach. 
I put off getting into my bread allowance as long as I could, but at last reached into my overcoat pocket. The packet was gone. I sprang up for the bench, looking beneath it, retracing my steps to the station. Whether I had dropped it or, or it had been stolen, the bread was gone, and with it, the ration coupons. At last, a train pulled into the station, and we crowded eagerly into it, but it was for military personnel only. Late in the afternoon, we were allowed to board a mail train, only to be put off two stops farther on to make room for a food shipment. The trip became a blur. We reached the huge, bomb-gutted terminal in Berlin sometime after midnight. It was New Year's Day, 1945. Betsy had been right. She and I were out of prison. Snow drifted down from a shattered skylight as I wandered, confused and frightened, through the cavernous station. I knew that I must find the train to Yulzen, but months of being told what to do had left me robbed of initiative. At last, someone directed me to a distant platform. Each step now was agony in the stiff new shoes. When I reached the platform, at last the sign said, not Yuzlin, but Olsten, a town in Poland in exactly the opposite direction. I had to re... I had to cross those acres of concrete floors again. Ahead of me, an elderly man, pink cheek from working in the roof, roofless station, was raking bomb rubble into a pile. When I asked him for directions, he took me by the arm and led himself, led me himself to the proper platform. I was to Holland once, he said, once wistful with recollection. When the wife was alive, you know, right on the sea we stayed. The train was standing on the track as I climbed aboard. It was hours before anyone else arrived, but I did not dare take off. Get off for fear I would not find my way back again. By the time the train started up, I was dizzy for lack of food. At the first stop outside Berlin, I followed the other passengers into the station cafe. I showed the woman behind the cash box my Dutch guilders and told her I had lost my coupons. That's an old story. Get out of here before I call the police. The trip was endless. Many miles of track could be traveled only at a crawl. Some sections were gone altogether, and there were interminable, long detours and many changes of train. Often we did not stop in a station at all for fear of air raids, but exchanged freight and passengers in the countryside. And all the while, out my window passed once beautiful Germany, fire-blackened woods, gaunt ribs of a church standing over a ruined village, Bremen, especially, brought tears to my eyes. In all that wasteland, I saw one human being, an old woman poking at a heap of bricks. In Usland, there was a long wait between trains. It was late at night. The station was deserted. As I dozed in an empty coffee bar, my head dropped forward until it rested on a small table in front of me. A blow on my ears sent me sprawling almost to the floor. This is not a bedroom, the furious stage and agent shrieked. You, could u you can't use our tables to sleep on. Trains came. Trains didn't come. I climbed on and off, and then I was standing in line at a customs shed, and the sign on the little station building said, Norwurschens. As I left the building, a workman in a blue cap and blue overalls stepped up to me. Here, you won't get far on those legs. Hang on to my arm. He spoke Dutch. I clung to him and hobbled across some tracks to where another train was waiting. Engine already puffing smoke. I was in Holland. We jerked forward. Flat snow-covered fields glided past the window. Home. It was still occupied Holland. German soldiers still stood at intervals along the tracks, but it was home. The train was going only as far as Groningen, a Dutch city, not far from the border. Beyond that, rails were torn up and all except government travel banned. With the last of my strength, I limped to a hospital near the station. A nurse in sparkling white uniform invited me into a little office. When I told her my story, she left the room. In a few minutes, she was back with a tray of tea and rusk. I left the butter off, she said. You're suffering from malnutrition. You must be careful what you eat. Tears tumbled into the hot tea as I drank. Here was someone who felt concerned for me. 
There were no available beds in the hospital, she said, but one of the staff was away, and I was to have her room. Right now, I have a hot tub running. I followed her down gleaming corridors in a kind of happy dream. In a large bathroom, clouds of steam were rising from a glistening white tub. Nothing in my life ever felt as good as that bath. I lay submerged to my chin, feeling the warm water soothe my scab-crusted skin. Just five minutes more, I would beg each time the nurse rapped at the door. At last, I let her hand me a nightgown and led me into a room where a bed was turned down and waiting. Sheets. White sheets, top and bottom. I could not get enough of running my hands over them. The nurse was tucking a second pillow beneath my swollen feet. I struggled to stay awake. To lie here clean and cared for it was such a joy I did not want to sleep through a minute of it. I stayed in the hospital at Grogan in ten days, feeling my strength return. For most meals, I joined the nurses in their own dining room. The first time I saw the long table set with silverware and glasses, I drew back in alarm. You're having a party? Let me take my tray to my room. I did not feel ready for laughter and social chatter. The young woman beside me laughed as she pulled out a chair for me. It's not a party. It's just supper and skimpy enough at that. I sat down blinking at knives, forks, tablecloth. Had I once eaten like this every day in the year? Like a savage watching his first civilized meal, I copied the leisurely gestures of the others as they passed bread and cheese and unhurriedly stirred their coffee. The ache in my heart was to get to Willem and Nolly, but how could it be done with the travel ban? Telephone service, too, was more limited than ever, but at last the girl at the hospital switchboard reached the telephone operator in Hilversum with the news of Betsy's death and my release. In the middle of the second week, hospital authorities arranged a ride for me on a food truck headed south. We made the illegal trip at night and without any headlights. The food had been diverted from a shipment headed for Germany. In the gray early morning, the truck pulled up to Willem's big brick nursing home. A tall, broad-shouldered girl answered my knock and then went dashing down the hallway with news that I was here. In a moment, my arms were around tying and two of my nieces. Willem arrived more slowly, limping down the corridor with the help of a cane. We held each other a long time while I told them the details of Betsy's illness and death. Almost, said Willem Sully. Almost. I could wish to have the same news of Kick. It would be good for him to be with Betsy and father. They had had no word of this tall blonde since his deportation to Germany. I remembered his hand on my shoulder, guiding me to our bicycles through the blacked-out streets to Pickwick's. Remembered his patient coaching. You have no cards, Tante Cory. There are no Jews. Kick. Are, that, are the young and brave as vulnerable as the old and slow? I spent two weeks in Hilverson trying to adjust to what my eyes had told me the first moment. Willem was dying, only he seemed unaware of it as he hobbled along the halls of his home, bringing comfort and counsel to the sick people in his care. They had over fifty patients at the moment, but what I could not get over was the number of young women in health, nurses' aides, kitchen helpers, secretaries. It was several days before I perceived that most of these girls were young men in hiding from the forced labor conscription, which had grown more ruthless than ever. And still, something in me could not rest until I got back to Harlem. Nolly was there, of course. But it was the Beji, too. Something in the house itself that called me, beckoned me, told me to come home. The problem again was getting there. Willem had the use of an official car for nursing home business, but only within a radius of Hilverson. Finally, after many relayed phone calls, he told me the trip had been arranged. The roads were deserted as we set out. We passed only two other cars all the way to the rendezvous spot where the car from, from Harlem, ahead, pulled off into the snow at the side of the road, 
We saw it. A long black limousine with official government plates and curtained rear windows. I kissed Willem goodbye and then stepped quickly as instructed into the rear of the limousine. Even in the curtain gloom, the ungangly bulk beside me was unmistakable. Um Herman, I cried. Oh, dear Cornelia. His great hand closed around both of mine. God permits me to see you again. I had last seen Pickwick sitting between two soldiers on the prison bus in The Hague, his poor bald head bruised and bleeding. Now here he was, waving aside my sympathy as though that had been an incident too trivial to recall. He seemed as well informed as ever about everything that went on at Harlem. As the uniformed driver sped us along the empty roads, he filled me in on all the details I ached to know. All of our Jews were safe except for Mary Atali, who had been seen, sent to Poland following her arrest in the street. Our group was still operating, although many of the young men were in hiding. He warned me to expect changes at the Beji. After the police guard had been removed, a series of homeless families had been housed there. Although at the moment he believed the living quarters above it, above the shop, were empty, even the house was unsealed. Loyal twos had returned from Schrodenfinnigan and reopened the watch business. Mr. Bookers, the opt optician next door, had given her space in his shop from which she had taken orders to give to our repairmen in their homes. As my eyes adjusted to the dim light, I made out my friend's face more clearly. There was perhaps an extra knob or two on the mishappened head. Teeth were missing, but to what? To that vast, kindly ugliness, the beating had made no real difference at all. Now the limousine was threading the narrow streets of Harlem, over the bridge on the Sparnge, across the Grope Market in the shadow of St. Bavos into the Bartelestrat. I was out of the car almost before it stopped, running down the alley through the side door and into Nolly's embrace. She and her girls had been there all morning, sweeping, washing windows, airing sheets for my homecoming. Over Nolly's shoulder, I saw two standing in the rear door of the shop, laughing and sobbing both at once, laughing because I was home, crying because Father and Betsy, the only two people she had ever allowed herself to love, would never be. Together we trooped through the house and shop, looking, stroking, remembering how Betsy would set out these cups, remember how Meta would scold you see for leaving his pipe here. I stood on the landing outside of the dining room and ran my hand along the smooth wood of the frusion clock. I could see Father stopping here, capering at his heels. We mustn't, we mustn't let the clock run down. I opened the glass face, moved the hands to agree with my wristwatch, and slowly drew up the weights. I was home. Life, like the clock, started again. Mornings, repairing watches in the workshop. Noons most often bumping my tireless bicycle out to Boston's Hovenstraat. And yet, in a strange way, I was not home. I was still waiting, still looking for something. I spent days prowling the alleys and canal banks nearby, calling Mar or Charlotte, Marl, our kitten, by name. The elderly vegetable lady three stores down told me the cat had re meowed at her door the night of the arrest, and she had taken him in. For months, she said, the small children of the neighborhood had band together to bring food to Opus Kitty. They had brought scraps from the garbage pails and even tidbits from their own scanty plates smuggled past watchful mothers. Mr. Hoshbosh had remained sleek and fat. It was mid-December, she said, when he had not appeared one night to her call, nor had she seen him since. And so I searched but with a sinking in my heart in this winter of Holland's hunger. All my search, searching, brought not one single cat or dog to my recall. I missed one more. I missed more than the cat. The Beijing needed people to fill its rooms. I remembered Father's words to the Gestapo chief in The Hague. I will open my door to anyone in need. No one in the city was in greater need than its feeble-minded. 
Since the start of the Nazi occupation, they had been sequestered by their families in back rooms, their schools and training centers shut down, hidden from a government which had decided they were not fit to live. Soon, a group of them was living at the Beji. They still could not go out on the streets, but here at least they had new surroundings and a program of sorts, which the time I would take from the shop. And still my restlessness continued. I was home. I was working and busy, or, or was I? Often I would come home, too, with a start at my workbench to realize I had sat for an hour staring into space. The repairmen twos had found, trained under father, were excellent. I spent less and less time in the shop. Whatever or whoever I was looking for was not there, nor upstairs. I loved the gentle people in my care, but the house itself had ceased to be home. For Betsy's sake, I brought plants for every window seal, but I forgot to water them and they died. Maybe I missed the challenge of the underground. When the national group approached me with a request, I agreed eagerly. They had false release papers for a prisoner in the Harlem jail. Well, what could be simpler than to carry the document around the corner and through those familiar wooden doors? But as the doors closed behind me, my heart began to race. What if I couldn't get out? What if I was trapped? Yes, a young police lieutenant with bright orange hair stepped from behind the receptionist's desk. You had an appointment? It was Rolf. Why was he being so stiff with me? Was I under arrest? Were they going to put me in a cell? Rolf, I said, don't you know me? He peered at me. They're trying to refresh his memory. Of course, he said smoothly, the, the lady at the watch shop. I heard you were closed down for a while. I gaped at him. Why, Rolf knew perfectly, and then I recalled where we were. In the central foyer of the police station, with half a dozen German soldiers looking on. And I had greeted one of our group by name practically admitted a special relationship between us when the cardinal rule of the underground was I ran my tongue over my lips how could I have been so stupid Rolf took the forged papers from my shaking hands and glanced through them these must be passed upon by the police chief and the military over command together he said can you return them tomorrow afternoon at four the chief will be in a meeting until I heard no more at the words tomorrow after I had bolted for the door I stood thankfully on the sidewalk until my knees stopped knocking. If I'd ever needed proof that I have no boldness or cleverness of my own, I had it now. Whatever bravery or skill I had known, I had known ever shown were gifts of God, sheer loans from him of the talent needed to do a job. And it was clear from the absence of such skills now that this was no longer his work for me. I crept meekly back to the Beji. And it was at that moment, as I stepped into the alley, that I knew what it was I was looking for. It was Betsy. It was Betsy I had missed every moment of every day since I ran to the hospital window and found out that she had left Ravensbrück forever. It was Betsy I had thought to find here in Harlem, here in the watch shop and in the home she loved. She was not here. And now, for the first time since her death, I remembered... We must tell people, Corey. We must tell them what we learned. That very week, I began to speak. If this was God's new work for me, then he would provide the courage in the words. Through the streets and suburbs of Harland, I bumped my bicycle rims, bringing the message that joy runs deeper than despair. It was news that people needed to hear that cheerless spring of 1945. No bride of Harlem tree filled the air with fragrance. Only the stump that had been too big to haul off for firewood. No tulips turned fields into carpets of color. The bulbs had all been eaten. No family without its tragedy. In churches and club rooms and private homes in those desperate days, I told the truths Betsy and I had learned in Ravensbrück. And always at these meetings, I spoke of Betsy's first vision. A home here in Holland where those who had been hurt could learn to live again unafraid. At the close of one of those talks, a slender, aristocratic lady came to me. I knew her by sight, Miss Byron's Devon, whose home in the suburb of Blomendal 
was said to be one of the most beautiful in Holland. I had never seen it, only the trees at the edge of the huge park in which it was set, and so I was astonished when this elegantly dressed lady asked me if I were still living in this ancient little house on the Bartelestrat. How did you... Y yes, I do, but my mother often told me about it. She went there frequently to see an aunt of yours, who I believe was a charitable work, was in charitable work. In a rush, it all came back, opening the side door to let in a swish of satin and rustle of feathers, a long gown and a plumbed hat brushing both sides of the narrow stairs, then Taunty John standing in her doorway with a look that froze in the bones the thought of, a boun of bouncing a ball. I am a widow, Miss Byron Stahan was saying, but I have five sons in residence. Four are still alive and well. The fifth we have not heard from since he was taken to Germany. As you spoke just now, something in me kept saying, Jan will come back, and in the gratitude you will open your home for this vision of Betsy Timboon. It was two weeks later that a small boy delivered a scented envelope to the side door. Inside its slanted purple letters was a single line, Jan is home. Miss Byron Stahan herself met me at the entrance to her estate. Together we walked up an avenue of ancient oaks meeting above our heads. Rounding the final bend we saw it, a fifty-six room mansion in the center of a vast lawn. Two elderly gardeners were poking about the flower beds. We've let the gardens go, Miss Byron Stahan said, but I thought we might put them back in shape. Don't you think released prisoners might find therapy in growing things? I didn't answer. I was still staring at the gabled roof and the leaded windows, such tall, tall windows. Are there, my throat was dry, are there inlaid wood floors inside and a broad gallery around a central hall and bas relief statues set along the walls? Mrs. Byron Stahan looked at me in surprise. You've been here then? I don't recall. No, I said. I heard about it from... I stopped. How could I explain what I did not understand? From someone who's been here, she, fin she finished simply, not understanding my perplexity. Yes, I said. From someone who's been here. The second week in May, the Allies retook Holland. The Dutch flag hung from every window, and the Will Helmus was played on the liberated radio day and night. The Canadian army rushed to the cities the food they had stockpiled along the borders. In June, the first of many hundreds of people arrived at the beautiful home in Bloemendal, silent or endlessly relating their losses, withdrawn or fiercely aggressive. Each one was a damaged human being. Not all had been in concentration camps. Some had spent two, three, even four years hidden in attic rooms and back closets here in Holland. One of the first of these was Mrs. Kahn, widow of the watch shop owner up the street. Mr. Kahn had died at the underground address. She came, she came to us alone, a stooped white-haired woman who startled at every sound. Others came to Bloom and the Doll, scared body and soul by bombing raids or loss of family or any of the endless dis dislocations of war. In 1947, we began to receive Dutch people who had been prisoners of the Japanese in Indonesia. Though none of this was by design, it proved to be the best possible setting for those who had been imprisoned in Germany. Among themselves, they tended to live and relive their special woes. In Blumenthal, they were reminded that they were not the only ones who had suffered. For all these people alike, the key to healing turned out to be the same. Each had a hurt he had to forgive. The neighbor who had reported him, the brutal guard, the sadistic soldier. Strangely enough, it was not the Germans or the Japanese that people had most trouble forgiving. It was their fellow Dutchmen who had sided with the enemy. I saw them frequently in the streets. N.S. Beers with their shaved heads and furtive eyes. These former collaborators were now in pitiful condition. 
turned out of homes and apartments, unable to find jobs, hooted at in the streets. At first it seemed to me that we should invite them too to the Blumenstahl to live side by side with those they had injured, to seek a new compassion on both sides, but it turned out to be too soon for people working their way back from such hurt. The two times I tried it, it ended in open fights, and as soon as the homes and schools for the feeble-minded opened again around the country, I turned the Beji over to these former NS beers. This was how it went. Those years after the war, experimenting, making mistakes, learning, the doctors, psychiatrists, nutritionists, who came free of charge to any place that cared for war victims, sometimes expressed surprise at our loose runways. At morning and evening worship, people drifted in and out. Table manners were odorous. One man took a walk into Harlem every morning at 3 a.m., I could not bring myself to sound a whistle or to scold or to consider gates or curfews. And sure enough, in their own time and in their own way, people worked out the deep pain within them. It most often started as Betsy had known it would, in the garden, as flowers were bloomed or vegetables ripened. Talk was less of the bitter past, more of tomorrow's weather. As their horizons broadened, I would tell them about the people living at the Beji, people who had never had a visitor, never a piece of mail. When the mention of the Ennis beers no longer brought on a volley of self-righteous wrath, I knew the person's healing was not far away. And the day he said, those people you spoke of, I wonder if they cared for some homegrown carrots. Then I knew the miracle had taken place. I continued to speak, partly because the home and the Blumendahl ran across on contributions, partly because the hunger for Betsy's story seemed to increase with time. I traveled all over Holland, to other parts of Europe, to the United States, but the place where the hunger was greatest was Germany. Germany was a land in ruins, cities of ashes and rubble, but more terrifying still minds and hearts of ashes. Just to cross the border was to feel the great weight that hung over that land. It was at a church service in Munich that I saw him, the former SS man who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center at Ravensbrück. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time, and suddenly it was all there, the room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, Betsy's pain blanched face. He came up to me as the church was emptying and beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, he said, to think that, as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine, and I, who had preached so often to the people of Blumenthal, the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing. Not the slightest spark of warmth or charity, and so again I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him. All into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love itself. It took a lot of love. The most pressing need in post-war Germany was homes. Nine million people were said to be without them. They were living in rubble heaps, half-standing buildings and abandoned army trucks. A church group invited me to speak 
to a hundred families living in an abandoned factory building. Streets and blankets had been hung between the various living quarters to make a pretense of privacy, but there was no insulating the sounds. The wail of a baby, the dying of radios, the angry words of a family quarrel. How could I speak to these people of the reality of God and then go back to my quiet room in the church hotel outside the city? Before I, no, I, before I could bring a message to them, I, I would have to live among them. And it was during the months that I spent in the factory that a directory, director of a relief organization came to see me. They had heard of my rehabilitation work in Holland and he said they wondered I was, I was opening my mouth to say what I had no professional training in such things when his next word silenced me. We've located a place for the work, he said. It was a former concentration camp that's just been released by the government. We drove to Dartsmouth to look over the camp. Rolls of rusting barbed wire still surrounded it. I walked slowly up the cinder path between drab gray barracks. I pushed open a creaking door. I stepped between rows of metal cots. Window boxes, I said. We'll have them in every window. The bob wire must come down first, of course. And then we'll need paint. Green paint. Bright yellow-green. The color of things coming up new in the spring. End of chapter 15 Since then, together with a committee of the German Lutheran Church, Corey opened the camp in Darmstadt. In 1946, as a home and a place of renewal, it functioned in this way until 1960 when it was torn down to make room for new construction in a thriving new Germany. The home in Belfmadal served ex-prisoners and other war victims exclusively until 1950 when it also began to receive people in need of rest and care from the population at large. It is still in operation today in its own new building with patients from many parts of Europe. Since 1967, it has been governed by the Dutch Reformed Church. Willem died of tuberculosis at the spine in December 1946. His last book, A Study of Sacrifice in the Old Testament, was written standing because the pain of his illness would not allow him to sit at a desk. Just before his death, Willem opened his eyes to tell time. It is well. It is very well, with kick. It was not until 1953 that the family learned definitely that his 20-year-old son had died in 1944 at the concentration camp in Bergen-Belsen. Today, a Tinboom Street in Hilversum honors kick. As a result of his wartime experiences, Peter Van Wadden dis dedicated his musical gifts to God's service. He has composed many devotional songs, including a musical setting for the Psalms and Proverbs. Today, Peter, his wife, and their five children travel all over Europe and the Near East as a family singing group with a message of God's love. Well into her 80s, Corey continued her travels in obedience to Betsy's certainty that they must tell people, working and teaching in 61 countries on both sides of the Iron Curtain, to whomever she spoke. African students on the shore of Lake Victoria, farmers in a Cuban sugar field, prisoners in an English penitentiary, factory workers in Uzbekistan. She brought the truth they learned in Ravensbrück. Jesus can turn loss into glory. In the twelve years since Corey's death, physical objects around our home have taken on added, added meaning. An antique brass kettle, a small square picture frame, an even smaller round one. Little gifts from Corey that speak of big truths. The kettle reminds us about priorities. It was Betsy who spied it, dented and sooted and crusted in a junkyard one morning on her way to the market. She bought it with the meat money. Betsy, cried Corey, coming downstairs in the watch shop. What are you going to do with that old thing? Look, it won't even hold water. It's not meant to hold water, said Betsy with dignity. Well, what's it for then? It's not for anything. Oh, Corey, wait till I get the grime off. Can't you just see the morning sun glowing on this spout? 
I got this stew meat instead of a roast, Betsy went on. You know, stew is really easier for father to chew, and I'm not hungry today. Oh, Cory, this kettle is, will go on shining long after we've forgotten what we had for dinner tonight. And so it did. It shone for the hunted people who found shelter in the Beji. It shone for Cory when she returned there alone from the concentration camp and from her tireless trips to Russia, China, Vietnam. It shines in her home today, saying, What feeds the soul matters as much as what, as what feeds the body. In the square frame is a piece of yellow cloth cut in the shape of a six-pointed star. Across the star are four black letters. J-O-O-D, the Dutch word for Jew. When John and I were in Holland doing research for the hiding place, Corey took us to the home of Meyer Mosel, Eusebus. During the Nazi occupation, we sipped tea while Corey and Yusi reminisced. You take your pipe with you, Corey reminded him, recalling the practice drills. But you'd forget your ashtray, and I'd have to come running after you. Yusi sat down his cup and crossed the room to a massive antique sideboard. From the bottom drawer, buried beneath a pile of table linen, he drew out a scrap of yellow cloth cut in the shape of a star. All these years I wondered why I saved this thing, he said. Now I know. It was to give it to you, Corey. We picked out the frame for Yusi's star that very afternoon. For years it hung on Corey's wall, as it hangs now on ours, a symbol of bittersweet as a cross. To me, the star says, whatever in our life is hardest to bear, love can transform into beauty. And the little round frame, it holds a piece of cloth too, ordinary white cotton, the kind underwear is made of. In fact, it is underwear, a fragment of the undershirt Corey was wearing when the Discapa raid came. In prison, in solitary confinement, Idleness was eroding Corey's courage. Nolly smuggled needle and thread to her, but soon the thread was used up. Then Corey remembered the undershirt. She unraveled a hem. And now, animals, houses, faces, she covered the undershirt with embroidery. The design in the round frame is a flower, with elegant curling edges and six leaves on a graceful stem. You have to look close to see the flower. The thread, of course, is the same color as the cloth. And underwear, even a dear friend's, well, it isn't the most costly of things Corey gave us, but it's the one that speaks most clearly now that she's gone. The circle of white cotton tells us that when we're feeling poorest, when we've lost a friend, when a dream has failed, when we seem to have nothing left in the world to make life beautiful, that's when God says, you're richer than you think. Elizabeth Sherrill, New York, April 1995. I really hope that you have enjoyed the reading of The Hiding Place. I think that it will give you courage. All of the scriptures came to life in their time of imprisonment. They were living the scriptures. They were living the scriptures. And every scripture became real to them as if they were written for their very time. And I pray they do to you as well. Whatever we face, brothers and sisters, let's face it with courage in the Lord and our Savior Christ Jesus who suffered. And let us love one another, loving others, even in their hatred or their anger loving them right to the feet of Jesus Christ. I pray I have the strength and courage to do just that, for I know that it is not of myself that I would be able to, but of God's rich love that would work within me. May the Lord bless you all, and may he keep you, always guiding you in the truth of who he is, in his love, all the way to the end, and I pray that we minister to many a heart and see many on that glorious day at the wedding supper of the Lamb. Shalom.